Hello and welcome to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. We are here to ease you into the weekend with a digest of the big stories of the week. To help, we will be joined by our fabulous news reviewers uh, discussing everything from the King's troublesome prostate to Therese Coffey's loose grasp of Central African geography. Uh, we'll also be bringing you all the latest sport and helping you decide just what to watch this weekend. But before all of that, the headlines this hour. And Tata Steel has confirmed plans to close two blast furnaces at its steelworks in Port Talbot with the loss of as many as 2,800 jobs. Shameful and appalling, Fujitsu's Europe boss on the editing of witness statements to defend the post office IT system. Less than an hour old, the search for a mother after her baby is found alive in a shopping bag in East London. And Japan becomes the fifth country to set down a spacecraft on the moon, but not without some jeopardy for its lunar landing. Uh, coming up, I will be joined by our news reviewers, the actor and impressionist Jan Ravens and writer for The Times, Kieran Gare. They are here until nine o'clock, helping us digest the biggest stories of the week. So what are we going to be talking about? Hmm, perhaps this might just get a mention. Rishi and the magically shrinking rebellion. 60 Conservative MPs defied the government over the Rwanda bill on Tuesday. All but a dozen of them disappeared just a day later. So has the Prime Minister shored up his party? Or will we be, in his words, back to square one when it goes to the Lords? And at last, a public apology from Fujitsu over its part in the post office scandal and a promise of compensation. But the questions are, when and how much? The sub-postmasters have joined a very long list of victims from Grenfell to Hillsborough to infected blood and beyond, still waiting for more than just once. So why does it take so long to correct institutional miscarriages of justice? And in the sports, Jordan Henderson says sorry if anyone was upset by his move to Saudi Arabia, but refuses to criticise his former paymasters, despite the fact he's quitting to return to Europe with Ajax just six months later. Great to have your company. We are here for the next three hours. Hold on tight. It's Friday night. Evening all. It was the news a community knew was coming, but was still devastating when it arrived. Thousands of jobs are likely to be lost after Tata Steel confirmed it is closing two blast furnaces at its plant in Port Talbot in South Wales. The decision has left steel workers angry and frustrated, but Tata insists the move is necessary to not only make the plant commercially viable, but also to have a significant effect on reducing the UK's carbon emissions. Uh, well, these are the numbers. There are 2,500 jobs expected to go in the next 18 months, with a further 300 roles also at risk, taking the total to 2,800. But the government and Tata have committed more than a billion pounds to transform Port Talbot, into a greener, more sustainable steel producer. Uh, the company insists the plans are subject to consultation and it will support all those potentially affected with a comprehensive support package. It's a difficult day. We uh, appreciate that. I think we've had these conversations with the unions, particularly over the last four months. Uh, uh, they're not happy with the outcome, that's clear. Uh, but we believe that we've seriously considered their proposal. We've looked at all the details. We've incorporated some plans, uh, some of the suggestions into our plan, but uh, obviously, uh, you know, we do believe that the proposed way forward is the best way forward to secure the future of the site. Mm. Uh, but unions have described the plans as a disgrace and called on the government to reevaluate its offer of investment in the farm. We put a plan together to get that we get a just transition from the old furnaces to electric arc furnaces which they promised us we would do over the four to five years. As far as we're concerned, uh, Tata have reneged on that and now tried to compress it into a few months and grown almost from A to Z. We will now go to our people and ballot our people and see what they want to do. Nothing is beyond. We will do absolutely anything. We will fight for every inch of ground on this site. Now, the European boss of Fujitsu has told the post office inquiry that he's seen evidence of staff witness statements being edited to remove mentions of the bugs and errors that plagued the Horizon accounting system and led to the wrongful convictions of hundreds of sub-postmasters. Paul Patterson said it was shameful and appalling that those being prosecuted were not told 
that the company knew about Horizon's issues. Sky's Ivor Bennett was there at the inquiry. Mr. Patterson. If Fujitsu was hoping this would shift the spotlight, they may be disappointed. Answers that led to more questions. Uh, I've just given uh, quite an extensive evidence to the inquiry. We've got some follow-up to do. We're going to be doing that and uh, make sure that we follow through. Thank you. It was Paul Patterson's second time in the hot seat this week. And as he did to MPs, he began by apologising. Fujitsu designed the faulty Horizon system and its bugs, we now know, were shared with the post office, and Fujitsu knew about them from the start. All the bugs and errors have been known at one, one level or not for many, many years, um, right from the very start of um, deployment of, uh, of this system. There were bugs and errors and defects which were, which were well known. It was an extraordinary admission, problems with the system the post office treated as sacrosanct for many years after. But it wasn't as extraordinary as what came next. Paul Patterson told this room that witness statements were edited to remove references to the bugs. And these were witness statements given by Fujitsu staff and used in the prosecutions of sub-postmasters, innocent victims who were denied a fair trial because the evidence was incomplete. And I uh, no doubt you would regard that as shameful. I would... Yes, that would be one word I would use. What's the other one? Um... Shameful, appalling, um, my understanding of how our laws work in this country, um, that all of the evidence should have been put in front of the sub-postmaster that the post office was relying on to prosecute them. Horizon Helpline, thank you for waiting. Uh, Lee yeah, Castleton uh, is one of the heroes of the ITV drama, a former sub-postmaster made bankrupt after being taken to court and pursued for more than £300,000. They should hang their heads in shame, the whole lot of them really. They've, they've conspired to prosecute people for 20 years and it's, it's still, the prosecutions are ongoing but the prosecutions still stand. But where Fujitsu said sorry, only silence from those who were at the post office. This was Angela Vanden Bogard, a former top boss. But the cameras and the questions aren't going away. Ivor Bennett, Sky News. A group representing almost 1,000 sub-postmasters across the UK has told Sky News the post office horizon system is still causing unexplained shortfalls which are wrecking businesses. The voice of the postmaster group alleges the discredited IT software continues to claim unexpected amounts of missing money. The post office insists the current system is robust, but it didn't deny the allegations put to it by Sky News. Our Scotland correspondent Connor Gillis has this exclusive report. There continues to be bugs. For people to say that it is historic and that there are no glitches in the system is mischievous. The hangover of a scandal that left deep scars in a discredited post office system where possible problems persist. The most unexplained thing I had was a discrepancy of, it was a couple of hundred pounds in fact, um, and I spent the night going through the safe looking at notes. Couldn't find anything, went to bed. I got up in the morning, I redeclared my uh, cash amount and there was no discrepancy, it had vanished. A mystery for Marlene who says repeated unexplained shortfalls means she stands to lose everything. My business is failing. I will go under. Do you think that's linked to Horizon? Um, in part? In part. In part to the discrepancies. My marriage is gone. If it does go under, uh, I'm going to have nowhere to live. My house is above the post office. Yeah, yeah. That's the reality of having a post office. That's the reality of it. Although the original faulty horizon system that was linked to so much misery has now been overhauled and the risk of unwarranted prosecution has been lifted, there is a sense among postmasters across the UK that history could be repeating itself. Four, please. Thank you. Sarah represents around 1,000 postmasters and alleges IT issues are still widespread. There's plenty of, of times that um, they can't account for where the mistakes are coming from. They've checked CCTV, they've checked transaction logs, and they don't know where they're coming from. Um, I'm, I'm sure the system has improved from 2015, but it's still happening. It's still having issues. Um, there's still plenty of people who are having sleepless nights. There's probably not a postmaster in the country who hasn't had some kind of issue with Horizon. 
The post office says the current version of the system has been found to be robust relative to compatible systems, but they say they are not at all complacent. Officials have said sorry to Marlene, but they did not deny the allegations that lingering issues are still causing headaches. Connor Gillis, Sky News, Perthshire. Now, new guidelines will allow school leaders to be able to stop Ofsted inspections if they think staff are struggling under pressure. It comes after teacher Ruth Perry took her own life after a poor report. Sky's Fraser Mott has the detail. It's back to school for the new year at St Ambrose Barlow High School, but for teachers, one thing hasn't changed. What's it like when you first get that call from Ofsted to say you're going to be inspected? It is a huge rush of adrenaline. The question you're asking yourself is, am I going to let people down? School inspections were paused before Christmas after a damning report into the death of one head teacher. A coroner ruled stress from a difficult offset inspection contributed to Ruth Perry's death and warned of future deaths if lessons were not learned. Now Ofsted's new boss has responded. As the new chief inspector, I'm determined to do everything in my power to prevent such tragedies in the future. We have accepted the coroner's findings and addressed her seven areas of concern. Ofsted says it will now train inspectors to watch for signs of distress and review how schools are rated on safeguarding. For head teacher Ben Davis, it's a welcome move. I think it sends the right message to the sector that people are listening at Ofsted. However, there's a great deal more that could be done than is initially uh, represented in the report. The Department for Education says it's committed to working with Ofsted during its major consultation in the spring, which it's calling its big listen. But one former schools minister says it needs to go further and stop grading schools with just one or two words. Parents can cope with the sophistication of being able to look at how a school's doing on a, a series of different things. Why would you sum up a whole hospital across all the different things that hospitals do in a single word? Why, why would you do that to anyone? A former schools inspector who set up a crowdfunding scheme to launch a legal challenge against Ofsted remains unimpressed with the proposals. Words are cheap. Action takes more thought. It is good to be wise after the event, but we need inspectors and at the, currently there is obviously an improvement in Lofsted's attitude. We need inspectors who understand the consequences of their actions. Mrs Perry's sister said if the latest reforms had been in place last year, perhaps my beautiful sister Ruth might still be with us today. But she says to prevent other such tragedies, more work was needed towards a radical overhaul of the culture of school inspections. Fraser Maud, Sky News, Salford. The UK Health Security Agency has warned rates of measles, measles vaccinations are well below the level set by the World Health Organization. The HSA has now declared a national incident over a disease which is far more contagious than COVID. There's certainly been a sharp recent rise in cases in the West Midlands. Well, a little earlier, we heard from the head of the HSA, Dame Professor uh, Jenny Harris. The UK population generally, if they have services available to them, and I mean in a way which is meaningful and accessible to them, uh, and that they have all the information that they need from somebody that they trust, most people are keen to make that choice and come forward for vaccinations. But I think also with measles, uh, it's a, there's a, a concern. So I'm a measles generation. I've had measles. It was very common when I was a child. But because the vaccinations have been actually so successful, uh, many parents of today have never seen measles. Uh, and so they won't understand how serious the disease can be uh, and therefore perhaps are not coming forward for vaccinations. Uh, police have launched an investigation after four people from the same family were found dead at a house near Norwich this morning. Officers forced their way into a dress in Cossey shortly before 7am following a call from a member of the public. The bodies of four people, two young girls, a 45-year-old man and a 36-year-old woman, were found inside the house in Allen Bedford Crescent. Police say they were all known to each other. The Duke of Sussex has withdrawn his libel claim against Associated Press, the publisher of the Mail on Sunday. He was suing the company over a 2022 article about his legal challenge against the Home Office's decision to change the public funding of his security. 
The UK COVID inquiry has been told all of Nicola Sturgeon's WhatsApp messages during the pandemic appear to have been deleted. At a hearing in Edinburgh, the inquiry was also told top Scottish government advisor, Professor Jason Leach, described erasing the messages as a pre-bed ritual. A newborn baby girl is in hospital this evening after being found in a shopping bag on the streets of East London. She was found by a passerby this morning who kept her warm until paramedics arrived. The baby, who's been named Elsa, is thought to have been less than an hour old when she was discovered. Police have appealed for the mother to come forward. If you are the baby's mother, please know that your daughter is well. No matter what your circumstances, please do seek help by dialing 999. Japan made history today after successfully landing a spacecraft on the moon, becoming only the fifth country to make it to the lunar surface. However, despite safely touching down on the moon, it appears it wasn't a complete success. Japanese space officials have revealed the moon sniper, as it's known, is not producing the electricity needed for it to continue operating beyond the lifespan of its batteries. The SLIM uh, has um, been communicating uh, to the Earth uh, station and it is um, receiving command from um, the Earth uh, accurately and uh, is, uh, re the spacecraft is responding to these um, um, uh, in a normal way. However, it seems that um, the, the solar cell is not generating electricity at this point in time. And since we are not able to generate electricity, and so the operation is being done using batteries on load. Ah, well, for more than this, I'm joined by our science and technology editor, Tom Clark. Tom, good to see you. And look, I was glued to my screen this afternoon as you were uh, commenting on this spacecraft coming in to land on the moon. And, and I, I suppose, and I think it was the same for you, the point at which we knew that things might not have gone entirely to plan was, well, where was the cheer? Where were the shrieks from the assembled scientists? But we, we, should, we should remember, though, this is, this, is, this is no small achievement. That's right, Neil. You could, you could just tell while they definitely achieved a touchdown on the lunar surface. The look on the faces in the control room and then the press conference afterwards, it was clear they hadn't nailed it. And quite what's gone wrong, we don't know yet. Hopefully we will find out. However, they've got battery power. They've also managed, they successfully managed to deploy two miniature rovers. Both of them have got cameras on them and both of them are talking to ground. So they could even get images to see what's going on. It's possible the lander just flopped over the wrong way. Its solar panels are pointing at the ground instead of the sun and they won't have power. Um, so a success, but not a complete victory. Uh, that'll be really disappointing, obviously, for the Japanese space agency behind this. But also, yeah, a moment of achievement. Landing on the moon is really hard. In the last year alone, there's been four missions that have failed to successfully make it to the moon or successfully land on it. It's got two new craters um, in the last six months alone because of uh, two failed missions crashing into it rather than executing this, this soft landing that's, uh, that you need to be able to do if you're going to do lunar exploration. So Japan can certainly congratulate itself on having achieved that, but they'll be very, very disappointed. This mission won't be able to demonstrate what it was really hoping to do, which was prove that it's done a really accurate landing. We'll get an update on that in the coming weeks. And that's important because if you want to go to the moon to use it as a lunar base, for example, to exploit its resources, you need to be able to land next to things you're interested in that are close by to be able to see what's where and how you need it. Particular interest is water ice. Um, and this mission was trying to land in a crater because it's in those shadowy craters that that water ice in lunar rocks might be found. But landing on a slope is hard, and that could have been what uh, came unstuck uh, for Japan today. But we'll have to wait and see. With just that battery keeping the probe alive, they haven't got much power to send much data back. Tom, why, why the renewed interest in, in landing on the moon? Is it simply, as, as you were suggesting before, it's all about, you know, if you want to have a colony on the moon, you have to be able to get there. I mean, it, I, think it's, I think even the Americans are heading back, and they haven't been there in 50-odd years. Well, you've got to remember, Back in the, 50, the 60s and 70s, getting to the moon was about national prestige. It was a space race between the USA and the USSR, and they chucked a huge amount of money at it. The Apollo missions cost billions and billions in today's money. 
And after then, there wasn't really much point. It's expensive and hard to do it. We're seeing now, even modern robotic missions, it's really, really hard. But what's happened is getting into space is much cheaper because of much, much lower cost launch capability and more powerful rockets. We've also got much better tech, so you can get an autonomous robot mission to land on the moon. You can't control things that far away. So we've got the technology to get there, and that makes it exciting because you could actually do a lot of groundwork with robots with a future idea to send people to the moon. That's what NASA is planning to do towards the end of next year as part of its Artemis mission. Artemis mission. China is also interested in sending uh, its astronauts to the moon. But you want to make sure you've got the resources to, to sustain something like a lunar base. That's what's, what, where the water might come in. To do that, you need robots. And there are now commercial ventures. This one wasn't. This was a nationally funded one. But there was a Japanese commercial venture that failed uh, last year. There was an American one that crashed back to Earth only yesterday. Because these companies are trying to show that they've got the capability to you know, partner up with national space agencies to start to exploit the moon for commercial gain. That's pretty controversial. There's a lot to talk about there, but that's certainly the direction of travel in the moon is getting busier and will probably stay that way despite failures, semi-failures, partial successes. I don't know what you want to call it like this one. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for partial success. Tom, for now, thanks very much indeed. You are watching Friday Night here on Sky News. Coming up, we will be reviewing the week's news with the help of the actor and impressionist Jan Ravens and Times journalist Kieran Gay. Uh, starting with, uh, well, the Conservative rebellion ending in victory for the Prime Minister. But is his party as united as he claims? As the boss of Fujitsu admits their Horizon computer caused a miscarriage of justice, we'll be discussing whether the 15 ongoing public inquiries will bring justice for some postmasters and other victims. And hold on tight for the sport. After less than six months, England midfielder Jordan Henderson has given up on the Saudi Arabian League. Why? We'll discuss that later. We all live in an uncertain world. From global conflict and crises to moments full of hope and unity. We'll take you to the heart of the story and help you understand the world around us. Join me, Yalda Hakim, on my new show, The World, on Sky News. There's a large number of companies or supposed companies advertising on there, a lot of people offering too good to be true deals, mm. and it's just going to become more and more common because it makes it possible. So a key thing, never give any money before you have the goods. That's probably the most important thing. Anyone who says, oh, just give me this and I'll get it to you, it's not going to happen. Uh, on top of that, anything where it doesn't fit the secondhand market value, anyone selling on Facebook Marketplace, they've got access to the internet as well, obviously. They know what's a reasonable price for it. If they're charging a third of that, there's a reason why. Scams are fraud. A lot of these marketplaces, they they give a new a new venue for fraudsters. That's yeah. really what they're doing. There's legislation for this, but it was years ago that action fraud was found not fit for purpose. We know that prosecutions for fraud are incredibly low. So yes, I would say Facebook should be doing more about this, but it's important to note to do that, they would need to be doing more to check people's identities. And that's something where there's other issues that come in. So there's action fraud that you can report it to, but they won't be able to do much unless it's significant enough to hit law enforcement. There is a charity out there called the Cyber Helpline, and they can give some advice and some support to individuals who are caught. But frankly, there's not much you can do. Uh, one of the best things to do is make sure that you are paying with a credit card because then you can dispute the charges. And if anyone's not willing to take a credit card payment, there are some serious questions you should be asking.
Uh, welcome back to Friday Night with Neil Patterson. Uh, time now to introduce our panel for the evening with us for the next couple of hours. Uh, the actor and impressionist Jan Ravens and journalist at The Times, Kieran Gare. Great to have you both with us this Friday night. Uh, but what should we start with? Uh, the Prime Minister faced what was forecast to be a stormy political week, but it seems, seems to be ending in somewhat calmer waters with the United Party. While Conservative MPs rebelled and resigned, the Rwanda plan was ultimately approved by the House of Commons. But the political battle now moves to the House of Lords, and the boats, which Mr Sunak promised, of course, to stop before the next election, they are still arriving. The legislation which deems Rwanda a safe country has been passed unamended in our elected chamber. The UK has been granting asylum to people from Rwanda. Only this government could sign a removal deal with Rwanda, only to end up taking people from Rwanda to here. He doesn't have a plan and it will be back to square one. The first migrants this year have been reported crossing the channel in small boats. It is back to square one. Stopping the boats and this is our third attempt to fix this problem. We would just go back to square one. A bit like pulling the pin out of a grenade, but not being prepared to throw it. Or you just go back to square one. And while parliamentarians debate the uh, whys and wherefores of that Rwanda bill, this is Dover, where Sky News has been watching as uh, asylum seekers in small boats have attempted to cross the channel today. It would take us back to square one. Mr Anderson. Are you going to rebel, Lee? Are you going to rebel? The House of Commons has spoken. The eyes have it, the eyes have it. Look! The Conservative Party has come together. Several letters of no confidence uh, in the Prime Minister have been submitted. The Rwanda Bill has passed. And that was the week in Tory, yet again, on the Friday programme. Um, let's get the views of our panellists. Jan, what, what do you make of this? I mean, it was, a, it was a bit of a farce this week, wasn't it? Well, it really makes me angry, actually, because yeah. I think, you know, this is such a waste of time and resources. And it's a policy that nobody, not even Rishi Sunak, believes is, you know, eventually going to happen. Mm. And there are so many more things that need to be done. So the whole, um, you know, the fact that we have all been talking about this all this week, that the House of Commons has been talking about it all this week, yeah. I think it's disgusting. I think, you know, there's all sorts, you know, there's, there's healthcare, there's education, there's proper housing for people. These are the things we should be talking about. And not only that, the money they've already thrown away on it. Yeah. When a, a Jess, um, Jess Jess Phillips stood up in the Commons the other day and made this really impassioned speech mm. about, you know, she works a lot with victims of abuse and um, uh, violence against women. And, you know, she was saying that I think the um, uh, the, the, the migrants that to get on a, a plane to Rwanda, it would cost £168,000 or something, whereas, you know, uh, victims of abuse that have about 60 quid spent yes. on them. I mean, it doesn't add up. It just doesn't add up in, a, in you know, in today's world where there's so many terrible things going on and they're fi it's this Tory infighting. I mean, Kim, do, do, do you share Jan's frustration? I mean, I, I suppose if, if you just look at the you know, dramatis personae and all of this, you know, of the three people who resigned over this particular piece of legislation, two of them ended up voting for it mm. and one of them abstained. Lee Anderson mentioned in that piece there. Yeah, exactly. Well, that, I mean, that's the thing. You had both Lee Anderson and Brendan Clark Smith, so Deputy Tory Chairman, suddenly resigned and then Lee Anderson turns around and votes for them and his excuse was he didn't want to pass the, la pass the Labour MPs <laughs> as a former Labour man as well. Suddenly he was terrified. Of and yet he my voted son comes end. up with better excuses yeah. for his bad behaviour. Exactly. Behavior. And, you know, part of their excuse was, well, we, we decided we didn't want to push the government too far because we were afraid it could end up toppling the government. And it does make you wonder, have they they've gone that far that they only decided to step back because they realise what they're doing could end up getting rid of their own government. Yeah. So it does highlight just the, as you said, the Tory infighting and how divisive migration has become among the Conservatives. But why is he use, you know, why is he deciding, you know, to die on this hill, as yeah. it were? Mm. You know, it seems like uh, such a, 
especially as he doesn't actually apparently believe in it himself. Mm. He's back when he was it. chancellor, back when he was chancellor, yeah. he made his opinions known about it, didn't he? So it? it's to appease this far right branch of the Tory party that are all afraid are going to join reform mm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and and this is like it seems like we're sort of back where we were, you know, before um, the referendum, yeah. where the, you know the referendum was called in order to appease this same branch of the party, and that, that look what we got out of that, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to give you both the opportunity to give to give you know the, the media a kicking, but but is is there perhaps an argument for saying you know the media has been somewhat complicit in all of this for for two days? Yeah. The news agenda was mm -hmm. dominated by a piece of legislation mm -hmm. which, even if it gets through the Lords, mm -hmm. even if it gets <coughs> through the, secu the, the it gets through the Supreme Court, will ultimately re result in the return of a handful this side of the election. Mm. What do you make? Yeah, no, no, you're right. But there, I mean, I guess the issue with that is it is, as I said earlier, it's such a divisive issue and it's mm. one of these things that you've just seen the party split and this infighting. And at the end of the day, it does make for a good story and it is interesting because you have all these big personalities. You've got people like Sweller Braverman yeah. um, coming in as well and getting involved. And it is interesting and it does, again, make one wonder, well... This issue started, I mean, I think it was Boris Johnson who said, you know, we'll stop the boats, etc. Yeah. Um, and yet it's landed in Rishi Sunak's inbox. And now he's the one who has to carry this policy forward. And as we've said, does he really believe in it? And now it's become, I think it will be the centre of the next election, which will be held later this year. But, but sorry, but Jan, but what, what, why, why does the Conservative Party continue to do this to itself? I mean, it used to be Europe that was the, uh, the European Union specifically that used to divide. We come out of the European Union and suddenly it's a plan to send people on planes to Rwanda that's, you know, splitting them down the middle. Well, not even down the middle, let's be honest about it. It's a, it's a faction. Mm. It's, it, it seems like, you know, and it, it, it also seems to me so, like, um, evil in a way that they're sort of saying, you know, this, you know, is the will of the British people. Mm. Which is, you know, they're getting from nowhere. They, 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 it wasn't in their manifesto. Rishi Sunak wasn't voted for by the British people anyway. Mm. It's, you know, uh, how does, you know, how is he intuiting that this is what we want? You know, we want, you know, decent class, classes for our kids. We want decent homes for to live in, you know. And a decent NHS. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and, and of course, when he was waylaid by a member of the public today, what was the topic? Mm. It wasn't Rwanda, it was the NHS. Guys, we will pause there because we've got a little bit of breaking news that we want to bring you. Um, an indictment has been filed in the first judicial district court in Santa Fe. This involves Alec Baldwin and regards, of course, the, the shooting on the movie set uh, of the movie Rust. Uh, Baldwin's lawyers have released a brief statement. Uh, Luke Nikas and Alex Spiro uh, saying this, we look forward to our day in court. I suspect we will see much more on that story uh, over the weekend. Uh, stay where you are, though. Uh, coming up, we will have plenty more from our news reviewers, uh, Jan Riggins and Kieran Gear, uh, including a dramatic week for the royal family as ill health disrupts their engagements and visits for months on end. That's next.
welcome back. Uh, Buckingham Palace may well have talked about planned operations and seeking treatment, but the ill health of the King and Princess of Wales has dealt a blow to the regular royal routine. Uh, William will be taking time off while Kate is recovering. The King is also expected to postpone a series of engagements and meetings following his expected prostate operation next week. Now, the loss of three of the most senior royals means we will be seeing a lot less of the family for many weeks. Uh, let's bring in our panel again, uh, Jan and Kieran. Kieran, to, Kieran, to you first. Um, it, 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 it is an interesting one. We were discussing this in the break, but, but Charles, you know, we're talking as men here, Charles choosing to let it be known that it was an issue with his prostate, I think will be something that plenty of people will welcome. It's not something that men discuss often mm. enough, obviously. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, regardless of your feelings about the royal family too, the fact that when Charles came out and said, you know, it's a it enlarged prostate, I mean, the day after, I think every few seconds there were, or I think there were about 11 times the amount of normal searches for that condition on the NHS website. So that just shows how, I guess, influential he is and what he says and people take notice. And as you've said too, men generally are a bit more hesitant with health issues, especially since it's especially involved like that. in the prostate as well, yeah, let's exactly. be honest. Um, so I think, yeah, overall it's, it's, it's a positive thing for him to do, probably difficult. Um, and I guess of his age as well, it mm -hmm. then creates speculation about, you know, how, how well is he? And then that leads into a different conversation entirely. But I think overall, the fact that this was headline news and it clearly generated a lot of interest and a lot of men mm. seeking more information about it. I mean, at the end of the day, that, that is a good thing when people are taking action um, on their healthcare. Mm. And they were just looking at the, the headline in the mail. I mean, Jan, what have you made of, of the responses? Not, not just, of course, to the news about, um, about Charles, but also about Kate. I mean, this is the era of the slimmed down uh, working royals. And, slimmed and it, and down it's, quite literally in it's Kate's very, case. Yeah, indeed, yeah, indeed, <laughs> indeed. But I mean, th th at yes. times like this, I suppose you see the problems with that as a strategy because, I mean, who's doing the heavy lifting for the next three months? Well, if you can call it heavy lifting. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, so William, you know, is apparently dealing with childcare, you know, as well as, you know, seeing to the recovery of his Heaven wife, for you know, <laughs> along with a fleet of staff, no mm. doubt. But anyway, I mean, you know, obviously one wishes them both yeah, well. And also, I think, you know, one should say, well, you know, I think it's brilliant that Charles has come out and said it's prostate cancer because there's all sorts of symptoms of prostate cancer that you don't necessarily want everybody knowing. Um, and I think equally, if uh, if Kate has decided, you know, that she wants to say I'm having an abdominal operation, I mean, you know, and you don't necessarily want everyone to know about your bits and bobs and what's mm -hmm. going on, um, then, you know, that's also, I think, her prerogative. I don't think we, you know, I don't think there's a need to know here. But I do think, you know, the Daily Mail in particular it has kind of gone into a kind of pink fit about it. I, I did read this, <laughs> um, this headline from an article by Richard Kay, their mm -hmm. royal correspondent. And he says, um, through tears, I think he says, uh, the double blow of King Charles and our future Queen Kate's medical uh, treatment leaves the nation reeling. It sends a shiver down our spines <laughs> and shows how threadbare royal resources are. <laughs> and like, you know, you were saying in the, in the introduction, we're going to be seeing a lot less of the royals. <laughs> <laughs> How are we going to calm, go? calm yourself. Yeah. Calm yourself. <laughs> does, does, this, does this perhaps, though, Kieran? Does it do, do, does it perhaps set something of a precedent? I mean, do we have do we have a right to know about? Uh, I, I, I mean, it is probably a different situation when you're talking about the monarch as to when you're talking about the the, the wife of the mm -hmm. you know second in line. But but do we have a, a a basic right to know what is going on? I mean, I, I, as I say, I think it's incredibly positive that he's talking about prostate cancer, mm. uh, talking about his prostate, I should say, mm. in, in a manner in which mm. you know most men don't. Mm. Um, I mean, I suppose so. But I guess I guess there's two issues here too. I mean, it's and, and the Kate and Charles um, really bring it home too. I mean, Kate's decided she'd prefer to keep this issue private, whereas Charles has come out and said, well. This is exactly what's happening. And I guess that kind of reflects how pe most people in society would react to that too. Some people mm. clearly prefer to keep things like that private. Some would be happy to discuss it publicly. But I guess more broadly to your question about what we need to know about the royal family and what they do, uh, I suppose that's, that's an individual issue yeah. because some people do care deeply, as we just heard. <laughs> very, very um, deeply. Some you care deeply about what they're doing. Exactly. 
and other people don't. But then, you know, at the end of the, at the end of the day, especially here in the UK, the interest in the day to day lives of the royal family. I mean, it's quite, it's quite, um, it's it's on another level. To, to, to what extent, to what extent, Jan, in, kind of in, in, in your in your day job, does does this sort of thing play in to the kind of the caricatures and the, the, the impressions that you get? I mean, well, with, with the, the, I can't imagine that the Queen's kind of failing health towards the end was 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 a rich scene for kind of no, com, you know, for for, for no, co no, comedy. No. But I mean, I you know, they always sort of you know you always sort of say with good comedy doesn't punch down, you know, mm -hmm. and obviously if somebody's ill, you're not going to take the Mickey out of them. Um, but uh, I, I noticed that um, Camilla has been out and about, and C Camilla's one of those people who sort of, you know, she's, uh, you know, when you hear her making speeches, you know, she's actually sort of making speeches on behalf of the osteoporosis society. <laughs> you know. She's one of those people, blue-blooded people, that's actually too posh to open her mouth, you know, sort of you know, like that all the time. But I think she's a bit of a laugh, Camilla, actually. One gets the impression from people yeah. who've met her that she's, she's a bit of a laugh. And, and, you know, I think if she does do some more public engagements, you know, mm. people will enjoy meeting her. Yeah, I think you're right. And you're absolutely right on that. I've heard exactly the same thing. By the way, Jan, you're doing my answer phone message before you leave the street. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're going to move, we're going to move the topic on now. And uh, we, we report every day here at Sky News, of course, on the, on the sub postmaster scandal. Uh, but the hearings taking place are just one of 15, count them, 15 public inquiries taking place right now. They represent thousands upon thousands of people who've suffered a life-changing crime or injustice and now simply want to establish the truth. From Scottish child abuse, the Grandville fire, the alleged murder of innocent civilians by British special forces in Afghanistan and the infected blood and COVID pandemic inquiries. So tonight, we want to discuss why some people have to fight so long to get answers. At, well, today at the post office hearings, the boss of Fujitsu at the company who designed and maintained the Horizon computer system, well, he admitted his customers, his company's responsibility for hundreds of wrongful convictions. To the sub postmasters and their families, we apologize. Fujitsu apologizes and is sorry for our part in this appalling miscarriage of justice. This inquiry is examining those events forensically over many, many decades, which involved many parties, not least Fujitsu and the post office, but other organisations and individuals. We are determined to continue to support this inquiry and get to the truth wherever it lays. And at the conclusion of the inquiry and the guidance from this inquiry, engage with government on suitable contribution and redress to the sub postmasters and their families. General guys, we will talk about the general point about public inquiries and their utility in just a second, but I want to give you both the opportunity to share in the anger that I have felt at various points this week. There we have contrition from Mr. Patterson after Fujitsu has challenged every case, taken it all the way to the Court of Appeal and, and, and tried to take it further on occasion. They've been altering witness statements. Evidence has disappeared. It is a scandal. It is an absolute disgrace. And I'm sorry, I'm not sure that someone sitting there nodding away, expressing their concern does anything other than make my blood boil. Well, yeah. and admit, you know, admitting, when you see somebody saying, you know, we, we, we agree, you know, we, abs we absolutely admit our part in this. Mm. Well, then why not say, OK, Fujitsu, so, you know, you'd better get, you know, get, go to the bank manager and say, we need a hell of a lot of money yeah. here. Because, I mean, it's the, the amount of people that need compensating for their loss of livelihood mm. There's so many of them, and it's so much money. And it's and it's not even it's not even compensation that they're getting. They're doing, Alan Bates has started calling it financial redress because yes. it's it just merely covers that which you've lost. Not not everything. Not your kind of the damages to your rep, yeah. damages for your reputational damage and so on. Yeah. It's yes. Yeah, and great. also it's like well, we're, basically we're sorry we got found out yeah. because for twenty you know nearly twenty mm. years. Yeah. Whoops, yeah. sorry. Uh, for yeah. nearly twenty years, you know mm. they've been saying. Um, uh, you, you know, no, 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 mm. you're the only one. You're the only, it's, it's, which is like some sort of mental torture, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, it was, it was the drama, which is, which mm. I think actually on a, on a separate point, you know, the power of drama, you know, the power Absolutely, of good yeah. writing, 
good acting, of ITV for putting it mm. on. That is like, you know, we need stories. You know, we need investment in the arts. Mm. We need, you know, this is what made people engage with it and put the pressure on to, um, mm. you know, the powers that be to do yeah. something about it. Yeah. I mean, just on the, on, the, on the broader point though, Kieran, I mean, this inquiry will take years to mm. conclude and yeah. come to its conclusions. Infected blood has yeah. been dragging yeah. on. Mm. As we said, 15 mm. of them up and running at the moment. Mm. I'm, I'm just at a point where I'm beginning to wonder mm whether these things actually serve a vital function. Yeah. I mean, all of the stuff that mm. was in that doc, the, the, the drama, the ITV drama, mm. was discovered by journalists doing hard, hard mm -hmm. work and got it out into the mm. public domain. The public inquiry will tick boxes along the yeah. lines and, and check yeah. it. But so, so why are we waiting years, yeah. Yeah, years well, for something to happen? Yeah, and, and you, you mentioned the infected blood scandal. I mean, mm. as we all know, that was the 1970s, it's the ridiculous. 1980s, and thousands of people lost their lives. And yeah. well, it was only very recently, I think it was Theresa May's government, that that said they would, they would open a public inquiry into it. And even now there's delay after delay. And you look at something like the, the Bloody Sunday inquiry, and that took 12 years. And they've spent, I think, over 210 million pounds just on the inquiry alone, not to mention something like the COVID inquiry, which unlike Sweden, for example, wrapped up, I think they wrapped up their COVID inquiry before the UK even started theirs. And France and Japan in a similar position, and yet, you look at the COVID inquiry and it became very much, you know, who, who do we blame? Yeah. Um, who hates who? And at the end of the day, should Boris Johnson have been leading the government? Would we let him do that again? Probably not. So the answers are sort of there. But then, of course, you have people like the postmasters or the people who, um, from the infected blood, blood scandal. Mm -hmm. And it's a moment for them, I guess, to, to really let the country know what happened to them. And there's not really another platform where they can do that. Um, so I think, I mean, it's, it's obviously a hard one, but I think in that respect. Sorry. No, no, no. I was just going to say that isn't mm. there a point where, you know, when you see a guy saying, yes, you know, we admit it, mm. isn't it then, so, okay, well, let's, you know, out, out of the public inquiry and mm. into that courtroom mm. and, and let's, you know, it, yeah. is there not a kind of way of just well, speeding it all up a I, bit? I think, Wish. but with that though, it's also, uh, I think I think it's, Gren Grenfell's a perfect example with that. Mm. The, um, I mean, the DPP have said, well, we're not going to do anything until the inquiry is over. And they're now looking at 2026, possibly for the final report. So if, I mean, if charges do stem from that, it just seems, it just seems yeah. far, far, far too long. Um, guys, we are going to leave it there. You will be back in the 8 o'clock hour for, for, for much, much more. Uh, for us, however, uh, we are going to be back... Uh, well, we're going to take a quick break, in fact, uh, because after the sport... Ah, good, love this one. Uh, more history for the teenage dart sensation, Luke not so littler uh, throwing a nine-darter at the Barry Masters. That's coming up next. I'm Katie Spencer and I'm Sky News' arts and entertainment correspondent. As a team, we've interviewed some of the biggest stars in the world, the likes of Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, Sir Elton John. We try to give you an honest sense of how these people really are. I'm David Blevins and I'm Sky's Senior Ireland Correspondent. I'm based in Belfast, a city transformed by peace but still struggling with its past. Politically, the two sides are as far apart as ever and it's over that question of who has sovereignty in Northern Ireland. The very issue that's been the source of tension here for generations. It takes 60 minutes to cross the Irish Sea. It took the British monarchy a century. I've spent 25 years reporting the journey from conflict to peace. The political parties of Northern Ireland have reached agreement. We help you understand the world with us. 
Today, we have reached an agreement with the Conservative Party on support for government in Parliament. We already know what the government gets out of this deal. What exactly does the DUP get out of it? Well, £1.5 billion. Pounds. Welcome to Winterfell. It's an iconic location in this globally acclaimed drama. Ophelia was the most powerful hurricane this far east in the Atlantic on record. Oh you can't live in a place like this and not appreciate the environment. Welcome back. Uh, time to talk sport. And Jordan Henderson has been speaking for the first time since ending his self-imposed exile in Saudi Arabia, offering an apology of sorts, but choosing not to criticise his now former Saudi Pro League paymasters. Uh, let's bring my colleague from Sky Sports News, Dave Fulton. Dave, good to see you this evening. Uh, Henderson, he's a card. Sorry, Neil, I asked you then to say again. He's a card. What, what on earth is he up to? Um, Jordan Henderson, yeah, look, it's, it's a strange one, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, he's gone out to join up with Stevie Gerrard at El Etifak, and then, and then in, six months later, he's back. He had uh, quite a lot of stick uh, for, for going out there. Uh, like a lot of people who go out and, and play sport in Saudi Arabia, be it live golfers or footballers, they talk about growing the game when I think that most of us kind of cynical folk think that actually it, it's about the cash. But he's back, he's going to play uh, for Ajax. Perhaps there was talk of him coming back to the Premier League. He insists he's coming back for football reasons. He's also been apologising to the LGBTQ plus community. Let's take a listen. I said six months ago um, that if I offended anybody or if people felt as though I let them down, then I apologise for that and I'll, I'll apologise again. But as I said before, my beliefs have never changed, never will. Um, and again, I can only apologise if people do feel let down. But I haven't changed as a person, never have. And I just want to continue to focus on my football. Uh, Jordan Henderson, time for you to take us through the rest of the sport. Thanks, Dave. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people, more active. Live life with Vitality. Twenty twenty four will mark the return of the Olympic Games to Europe for the first time since London twenty twelve. Team GB sprinters have an enviable strength in depth, but only three male and three female sprinters can compete in the individual events. Eugene Amodadzi is one of a number of British sub ten second one hundred metre male sprinters. He's a little bit different though. Yeah, a late starter, very late in fact. He began just five years ago, narrowly missing out on the World Championship 100 metre final last summer at the age of 31. He's getting faster though, and that's all the more incredible as before he began sprinting, he'd forged himself a career. Meet the world's fastest accountant. Right now, I, I still don't refer to myself as a sprinter. I'm just a chartered accountant. World's fastest accountant, that's what I like to call myself. Wait, hey, every penny, every little house, right? That's what that's what people think accountants are. I'm unbelievably proud of my accountant qualification. You know, my parents pushed me to, you know, go to school, do well, get good grades, um, and qualify, you know, as something. Being from a West African household, it was called like doctor, lawyer, engineer, um, accountant. So I guess I went down that route. So I'm incredibly proud of it, um, and you know, I've had those aspirations of climbing the corporate ladder. Ooh. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Sport done, time for the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, the weather is turning much colder from the north later this weekend, bringing a chance of significant snow and ice. Most places will, in fact, be chilly and cloudy, but largely dry this evening. However, northern Scotland is turning cloudier and breezier with outbreaks of rain. The cloud and patchy rain will slowly edge south across Scotland into the far north of Northern Ireland overnight. Elsewhere, it will be mostly dry with frost and freezing fog 
likely to form in any cloud breaks. What about the weekend though? Uh, Saturday, another cold and cloudy day, although some sunny spells will develop. Scattered showers will push southwards, mainly affecting northern Scotland, Northern Ireland, northwest England and North Wales. Those showers will turn increasingly wintry in the north as the winds turn northerly and strengthen, introducing much colder Arctic air. Uh, the patchy rain will clear south on Sunday, followed by much colder and brighter conditions. Wintry showers will affect parts of Scotland with significant wind chill along exposed coasts. As for Monday, well, it's looking to be very cold with a risk of snow and ice and a bitter northerly wind. Temperatures, well, you don't want to know what they're going to be. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Coming up in the 8 o'clock hour of Friday night with Neil Patterson, contrition from Fujitsu at the post office inquiry, where the company boss admits witness statements were changed to remove mentions of faults in their Horizon computer system. And thousands of job losses in Wales as Tata Steel looks for a greener future in Port Talbot. All that and much more after the break. Welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. This is the show where we take all the news, the good bits and the bad, and dissect them for your entertainment. We also want to think, you know, what you think, I should say, about the stories making the headlines and going viral this week. But first, the headlines this hour. And Tata Steel has confirmed plans to close two blast furnaces at the steelworks in Port Talbot, with a loss of as many as 2,800 jobs. Shameful and appalling, Fujitsu's Europe boss and the editing of witness statements to defend the post office IT system. Less than an hour old, the search for a mother after her baby is found alive in a shopping bag in East London. And Japan becomes the fifth country to set down a spacecraft on the moon, but not without some jeopardy for the lunar landing. 
Our news reviewers this evening, the actress and impressionist Jan Ravens and the Times writer Keaton Gare, uh, they are both still with us and they will be helping us with our regular feature, Good Week, Bad Week. Mm, uh, and it will include plenty of things, including Therese Coffey, who's right there. She had a little bit of a problem when it came to, to working out exactly what, uh, what Yvette Cooper was discussing uh, when she mentioned Kigali. We will have plenty more of that coming up just a little bit later. You're here with us for the next two hours up until 10 o'clock. Hold on tight, it's Friday night. Evening all. It was the news a community knew was coming, but was still devastating when it arrived. Thousands of jobs are now likely to be lost after Tata Steel confirmed it is closing two blast furnaces at its plant in Port Talbot in South Wales. The decision? Well, it's left steelworkers angry and frustrated, but Tata insists the move is necessary to not only make the plant commercially viable, but also have a significant effect on reducing the UK's carbon emissions. Well, let's take a quick look at the numbers. In total, 2,800 jobs are expected to go, 2,500 in the next 18 months, and a further 300 roles also at risk in the years to come. But the government and Tata have committed more than a billion pounds to transform Port Talbot into a greener, more sustainable steel producer. Our correspondent Adele Robinson reports now from South Wales. This is more than an iconic skyline for Port Talbot. Without this steelworks behind us, we'll be absolutely like a ghost town. It represents a century of steelmaking. Devastated, desperate, uncertain and overnight, to be perfectly honest, very hungry. And the lives intertwined with it. Now all that will disappear with the closure of two blast furnaces and the loss of 2,800 jobs. Gary's been here for 37 years. It's a way of life. We are steel men and women. We know nothing else. Empty, heartbroken feeling, to be honest with you. We, we, there's no one in, in this town and the surrounding communities who has done have someone involved in this. What are we going to do? And Andrew's dad worked here like him too. Emotionally, I, I'm a third generation. And to me, we've all got a tie to it. Even though I'm from the valleys, I, I'm a steel worker that's in my blood. That is part of the heritage. 100 years of steel making is about to end you unless we stop it. Part of plans to cut emissions. A new electric arc furnace will make no longer new, but recycled steel from scrap. A financial decision, say the Indian owners, Tata Steel, as well as a green one. It's a difficult day. We uh, appreciate that. I think we've had these conversations with the unions, particularly over the last four months. Uh, uh, they're not happy with the outcome, that's clear. We do believe that the proposed way forward is the best way forward to secure the future of the site. And with money from the UK government to help. We are absolutely committed to steel making in the UK and that's why the government provided half a billion pounds to support Tata. The alternative, by the way, was that the entire plant would be closed and all 8,000 jobs would be lost. This community exists because of these blast furnaces and for multiple generations it's all they've known. But it's not just about the people here, it's about the future of UK steel making. Tata Steel argue that their plans help secure that. Unions say the opposite. They're worried the UK will become more reliant on imports, but the more immediate concern decimating a community. If our members tell us they want to take industrial action, then that's what we'll do. They've got kids, all they want to do is feed their family and, and have a good life, and that's being taken away from them. So how much is the sentiment, we will not accept this? We, we won't. Yeah, we have no option but to fight. If we have to, we will. We hope Tata will change their mind. We hope the government will put more money in. A piece of steel-making history is about to be lost here that was perhaps inevitable. Nobody can imagine this place not being here. It's not in the community. This place is the community. For unions, the fight is far from over. Adele Robinson, Sky News, Port Talbot. The European boss of Fujitsu has told the Post Office Inquiry that he has seen evidence of staff witness statements being edited to remove mentions of the bugs and errors that plague the Horizon accounting system and which led, of course, to the wrongful convictions of hundreds of sub-postmasters. Paul Patterson said it was shameful and appalling that those being prosecuted were not told that the company knew about Horizon's issues. Sky's Ivor Bennett was there at the inquiry. If Fujitsu was hoping this would shift the spotlight, they may be disappointed. 
answers that led to more questions. Is saying sorry enough? Is saying sorry I've just, enough? Uh, I've just given uh, quite an extensive evidence to the inquiry. We've got some follow-up to do. We're going to be doing that and uh, make sure that we follow through. Thank you. Is saying sorry enough? Why haven't you met any sub-postmasters yet? You've been in the job for five years. Are you proud to work for the Jitsu? It was Paul Patterson's second time in the hot seat this week, and as he did to MPs, he began by apologising. Fujitsu designed the faulty horizon system, and its bugs, we now know, were shared with the post office, and Fujitsu knew about them from the start. All the bugs and errors have been known at one, one level or not for many, many years, um, right from the very start of um, deployment of, uh, of this system. There were bugs and errors and defects. Which were, which were well known. It was an extraordinary admission. Problems with the system the post office treated as sacrosanct for many years after. But it wasn't as extraordinary as what came next. Paul Patterson told this room that witness statements were edited to remove references to the bugs. And these were witness statements given by Fujitsu staff and used in the prosecutions of sub-postmasters, innocent victims who were denied a fair trial because the evidence was incomplete. And I uh, no doubt you would regard that as shameful. I would, yes, that would be one word I would use. What's the other one? Um, shameful, appalling. Um, my understanding of how our laws work in this country, um, that all of the evidence should have been put in front of the sub postmaster that the post office was relying on to prosecute them. Horizon Helpline, thank you for waiting. Lee Castleton is one of the heroes of the ITV drama, a former sub-postmaster made bankrupt after being taken to court and pursued for more than £300,000. They should hang their heads in shame, the whole lot of them really. They've, they've conspired to prosecute people for 20 years and it's, it's still, the prosecution's out ongoing but the prosecution's still standing. But where Fujitsu said sorry, only silence from those who were at the post office. This was Angela Vanden Bogard, a former top boss. But the cameras and the questions aren't going away. Ivor Bennett, Sky News. Uh, meanwhile, a group representing almost a thousand sub postmasters across the UK has told Sky News the post office horizon system is still causing unexplained shortfalls which are wrecking businesses. The voice of the Postmaster Group alleges that the discredited IT software continues to claim that unexpected amounts of money are missing every month. The post office insists the current system is robust, but it didn't deny the allegations put to it by Sky News. Our Scotland correspondent, Conor Gillis, has this exclusive report. There continues to be bugs. For people to say that it is historic and that there are no glitches in the system is mischievous. The hangover of a scandal that left deep scars in a discredited post office system where possible problems persist. The most unexplained thing I had was a discrepancy of, it was a couple of hundred pounds in fact, um, and I spent the night going through the safe looking at notes, couldn't find anything, went to bed. I got up in the morning, I redeclared my uh, cash amount and there was no discrepancy, it had vanished. A mystery for Marlene who says repeated unexplained shortfalls means she stands to lose everything. My business is failing. I will go under. You think that's linked to Horizon? Um, in part? In part. In part to the discrepancies. My marriage is gone. If it does go under, uh, I'm going to have nowhere to live. My house is above the post office. Yeah, yeah. That's the reality of having a post office. That's the reality of it. Although the original faulty horizon system that was linked to so much misery has now been overhauled and the risk of unwarranted prosecution has been lifted, there is a sense among postmasters across the UK that history could be repeating itself. Fault, please. Thank you. Sarah represents around 1,000 postmasters and alleges IT issues are still widespread. There's plenty of, of times that um, they can't account for where the mistakes are coming from. They've checked CCTV, they've checked transaction logs, and they don't know where they're coming from. Um, I'm, I'm sure the system has improved from 2015, but it's still happening. It's still having issues. Um, 
there's still plenty of people who are having sleepless nights. There's probably not a postmaster in the country who hasn't had some kind of issue with Horizon. The post office says the current version of the system has been found to be robust relative to compatible systems, but they say they are not at all complacent. Officials have said sorry to Marlene, but they did not deny the allegations that lingering issues are still causing headaches. Connor Gillis, Sky News, Perthshire. Uh, let's bring you more on the news breaking in just the last hour. A grand jury in the United States has indicted the actor Alec Baldwin over the fatal shooting on a film set in New Mexico. He now faces a charge of involuntary manslaughter. Uh, let's bring in our US correspondent, uh, James Matthews. James, always good to see you. I I explain exactly what is going on here. A different legal system, of course. Uh, words like indicted, not necessarily that familiar. W what does all this mean for Alec Baldwin? Uh, it's not good news for Alec Baldwin, Neil. Indicted, charged effectively with involuntary manslaughter. Not for the first time, you'll remember. He was previously facing the same charge that was dropped. This all goes back to the set of a movie, Rust, a Western movie, being filmed in October 2021 in New Mexico. Alec Baldwin was the lead actor, also the co-producer of that film. He was in the company of the cinematographer, Helena Hutchins, and also the movie's director. He had in his hand a handgun with, he thought, and it certainly should have been, fake ammunition. He says that he pulled back the hammer of the gun, the bit that's typically pulled by the thumb. He said he didn't pull the trigger, but what happened was the bullet went off. It killed the cinematographer, Helena Hutchins. It wounded the movie's director. There was an investigation into what happened, and there were charges initially for Alec Baldwin of involuntary manslaughter. That went away. Prosecutors dropped that charge in April. He has now been indicted once more, a charge again of involuntary manslaughter. What happened was they took a second look at the gun, reconstructed it with appropriate parts. They looked at a spent cartridge and deemed it, uh, they deemed the, it, uh, the fact or the truth to be that the trigger had been pulled. Their analysis said that given the tests, findings and observations, the trigger had to be pulled or depressed sufficiently to release the fully cocked or retracted hammer. Baldwin's not the only one charged as a result of that incident, of course. The weapons super supervisor on set, she faces charges of involuntary manslaughter and faces a trial starting in February. In response, we've heard nothing from Baldwin, the Hollywood star, yet, but in a brief statement, his lawyers say, we look forward to our day in court. James, many thanks indeed. New guidelines will allow school leaders to be able to stop Ofsted inspections if they think staff are struggling under the pressure. It comes after teacher Ruth Perry took her own life after a poor report. Sky's Fraser Mott has the story. It's back to school for the new year at St Ambrose Barlow High School, but for teachers, one thing hasn't changed. What's it like when you first get that call from Ofsted to say you're going to be inspected? It is a huge rush of adrenaline. The question you're asking yourself is, am I going to let people down? School inspections were paused before Christmas after a damning report into the death of one head teacher. A coroner ruled stress from a difficult offset inspection contributed to Ruth Perry's death and warned of future deaths if lessons were not learned. Now Ofsted's new boss has responded. As the new chief inspector, I'm determined to do everything in my power to prevent such tragedies in the future. We have accepted the coroner's findings and addressed her seven areas of concern. Ofsted says it will now train inspectors to watch for signs of distress and review how schools are rated on safeguarding. For head teacher Ben Davis, it's a welcome move. I think it sends the right message to the sector that people are listening at Ofsted. However, there's a great deal more that could be done than is initially uh, represented in the report. The Department for Education says it's committed to working with Ofsted during its major consultation in the spring, which it's calling its Big Listen. But one former schools minister says it needs to go further and stop grading schools 
with just one or two words. Parents can cope with the sophistication of being able to look at how a school's doing on a series of different things. Why would you sum up a whole hospital across all the different things that hospitals do in a single word? Why, why would you do that to anyone? A former school's inspector who set up a crowdfunding scheme to launch a legal challenge against Ofsted remains unimpressed with the proposals. Words are cheap. Action takes more thought. It is good to be wise after the event, but we need inspectors. And at the, currently there is obviously an improvement in Lofstead's attitude. We need inspectors who understand the consequences of their actions. Mrs Perry's sister said if the latest reforms had been in place last year, perhaps my beautiful sister Ruth might still be with us today. But, she says, to prevent other such tragedies, more work was needed towards a radical overhaul of the culture of school inspections. Fraser Maud, Sky News, Salford. The UK Health Security Agency has warned that rates of measles vaccinations are well below the recommended level set by the World Health Organization. The agency has now declared a national incident over a disease which is far more contagious than COVID. There has been a sharp recent rise in cases in the West Midlands, as Becky Johnson now reports. Ellie Roscoe has been left with ongoing health problems after becoming seriously ill with measles. I thought we wouldn't get through it. That, that's, that's the truth. Um, she was delirious. Her body was covered in the rash, which you couldn't touch her skin. She wasn't fully vaccinated as a child. Her mother had been concerned that the MMR jab caused autism, a health scare that's since been disproven. Am I risking measles or autism? And I thought at the time that the autism was far worse than the measles. If it was me in my situation, with having gone through measles, if I was having children, I would vaccinate them um, because it is a dreadful illness. They live in Birmingham, which has seen the largest number of cases in this recent outbreak. Schools have been urging parents to get children vaccinated. I think if, you, if you've got the children vaccinated, um, we should be quite safe, isn't it? I think parents that haven't have got something to worry about. Parts of London, too, have seen a rise in cases. This child's mother didn't want to be identified, but told us why she won't let her children have the vaccine. I do not like it. The ingredients they had in there, the stuff they had in there, and after actually researching and seeing many stories of how parents have actually vaccinated their kids and seeing how it actually affected them. MMR vaccine uptake has fallen right across the country. We're being warned measles could spread across other towns and cities. The number of cases has grown so rapidly that the UK Health Security Agency has now declared a national incident, meaning they'll focus resources on trying to limit the outbreak and targeting those most at risk. This lab in Birmingham is where all the latest cases are being confirmed. They will be very different and I cultural or religious or other reasons why people have not been vaccinated to this point. Now, some of them may not have been offered it. So, for example, a refugee from a country may never have been offered a vaccination. But health officials face a combination of misinformation, cultural and religious concerns and post-pandemic vaccine hesitancy. Becky Johnson, Sky News, Birmingham. Police have launched an investigation after four people from the same family were found dead at a house near Norwich this morning. Officers forced their way into an address in Cossey shortly before 7am following a call from a member of the public. The bodies of four people, two young girls, a 45-year-old man and a 36-year-old woman, were found inside the house in Allen Bedford Crescent. Police say they were all known to each other. The Duke of Sussex has withdrawn his libel claim against Associated Press, the publisher of the Mail on Sunday. He had been suing the company over a 2022 article about his legal challenge against the Home Office decision to change the public funding of his security detail. The UK COVID inquiry has been told all of Nicola Sturgeon's WhatsApp messages during the pandemic appear to have been deleted. At a hearing in Edinburgh, the inquiry was also told that top Scottish government adviser, Professor Jason Leach, described erasing the messages 
as a pre-bed ritual. A newborn baby girl is in hospital this evening after being found in a shopping bag on the streets of East London. She was found by a passerby this morning who kept her warm until paramedics arrived. The baby, who's been named Elsa, was less than an hour old when she was discovered. Police have appealed for the mother to come forward. Now, Japan made history today after successfully landing a spacecraft on the moon, becoming only the fifth country to make it to the lunar surface. But tonight, the moon sniper is running on batteries only after failing to produce the electricity needed for its full mission. Our science and technology... With the slim lander, Japan has made space history, becoming the fifth nation to execute a soft touchdown on the lunar surface. But you can tell from the faces at Mission Control that while they made the landing, they didn't exactly nail it. The, the solar cell is not generating electricity at this point in time. What went wrong? Possibly the lander failed to settle the right way up, like in this animation, and its solar panels are pointing at the lunar surface instead of the sun. But they're talking to their probe, and it successfully deployed two miniature rovers equipped with cameras which could in the coming days reveal what's happened and whether it achieved its key objective, demonstrating a precise landing for future lunar prospecting. Well, moon rock might not look very exciting. It contains rare minerals and also on certain parts of the moon's surface, water ice. And if you want to exploit that for a future lunar base, for example, you would need to land as close as possible to where those mineral deposits are. And it's that accuracy that the SLIM mission is trying to demonstrate. Unless they can restore power, it's unlikely SLIM will be able to fulfil its mission. But JAXA, Japan's space agency, has done better than others in the current race for the moon. In May, a privately funded Japanese lunar probe crashed into the moon. In August, Russia's Luna 25, Luna 25 also failed to stick its landing. A week later, India's Chandrayaan-3 landed successfully. And this week, a privately funded American lander crashed back to Earth after failing to make it to the moon. But there are more to follow. It's become marginally more affordable to send things to space, not just because there are more rockets and more capacity to launch things now, but also because computer equipment has gotten so much better. Japan has joined an exclusive club of lunar pioneers, but it could be weeks before we know just how successful it's been. Tom Clark, Sky News. You're watching Friday Night. Coming up, we will continue to review the week's news with the help of our guests at Jan Ravens and Kieran Gip. There they are, including why it has been a good week for the British public after one voter tried to get a straight answer from the Prime Minister. We'll also be discussing how and why Iran is having so much influence over many of the world's conflicts. That's all coming up. There's a large number of companies or supposed companies advertising on there, a lot of people offering too good to be true deals, mm. and it's just going to become more and more common because it makes it possible. So a key thing, never give any money before you have the goods. That's probably the most important thing. Anyone who says, oh, just give me this and I'll get it to you, it's not going to happen. Uh, on top of that, anything where it doesn't fit the second-hand market value. Anyone selling on Facebook Marketplace, they've got access to the internet as well, obviously. Yeah. They know what's a reasonable price for it. If they're charging a third of that, there's a reason why. Scams are fraud. A lot of these marketplaces, they they give a new, a new venue for fraudsters. That's yeah. really what they're doing. There's legislation for this, but it was years ago that action fraud was found not fit for purpose. We know that prosecutions for fraud are incredibly low. So, yes, I would say Facebook should be doing more about this, but it's important to note to do that, they would need to be doing more to check people's identities, and that's something where there's other issues that come in. 
So there's action fraud that you can report it to, but they won't be able to do much unless it's significant enough to hit law enforcement. There is a charity out there called the Cyber Helpline, and they can give some advice and some support to individuals who are caught. But frankly, there's not much you can do. Uh, one of the best things to do is make sure that you are paying with a credit card because then you can dispute the charges. And if anyone's not willing to take a credit card payment, there are some serious questions you should be asking. Welcome back. Uh, let's continue our review of the week's news. And of course, it is at this point we ask who's had a good week and who's had a bad one. The weekend is here, so who's relieved it's all over and who has finished a winner? Still with us, uh, our panellists, the actor and impressionist Jan Ravens and the Times journalist Kieran Gare. And guys, where, where should we start? Well, let's start uh, on a high. It has been a good week for the public. Uh, at least one woman uh, finally got to put a straight question to a politician. Rishi Sunak out and about in Winchester today when one woman stopped him to ask about the state of the NHS. It made me feel good about the future. So last year, towards the end of the year, we had two months with virtually no strikes in October and November. Well, that was a fortunate thing. And do you know what happened? The waiting list fell by 150,000 over those two months. And it just shows that when there aren't strikes, we really can make yeah. progress. Yep. So we didn't last year because of all yeah, the strikes, but, but you hopefully... You could stop it all. You could make it all go back to how it used to be, where we had, <laughs> not literally, <laughs> no, yeah. but where yeah. we had, if you had a problem, you could go to the hospital. My daughter yeah. spent yeah, seven hours waiting. Oh, That's not I'm sorry to hear that. The key thing is that we have resolved all the industrial action. I hope so. About, apart from the junior doctors who have... Uh, are still not saying yes, but everyone else has said yes. So, which Thank is good. I'm about to put a billion pounds. Um, Jan Kieran, well, as you can see, the encounter ended with a handshake, but I'm going to gently suggest that there were points during that which were excruciatingly uncomfortable. Jan? He doesn't ever really look comfortable when he's with a real person, does he? And, uh, and, <laughs> and I think that laugh, you know, when she says, if only you could make the NHS back the way it used to be, and you ah! <laughs> this immoderate laugh. Mm. And it's so sort of like, you know, no, 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 no. That is so sort of tone deaf, isn't it? And he doesn't seem to have, well, he certainly doesn't have the common touch. He, and he always sort of sounds a bit like the class creep, doesn't he? The school swap. <laughs> He's got that kind of vibe about him. Um, and I, I, I just don't think he... I don't think he reads the room very well. Mm. Kieran, wh what do you make of it? I was, in fact, I mean, this, this took me straight back to covering the 2010 general mm. election when I was the, the reporter who revealed mm. to a stunned world Gordon Brown calling a woman oh, a bigot yeah. from the back of his car as he drove off wearing my lapel mic, oh. which we did eventually get back off him. I mean, what do you make of it? Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, as you just, just mentioned there, Gordon Brown too, I mean, this is it's an election year and we hope that these things happen more often because it's so rare where you see a member of the public get to uh, get access to a politician like that and get their point across and then have it broadcast. Mm. Because generally, I mean, especially these days, everything they do is so scripted. I mean, that uh, press conference the other day, I think, after the Rwanda vote, that was like two minutes. Uh -huh. um, so there's so there's so little time to actually, you know, speak to speak to politicians as if they're real real people and that that woman just before i mean she really got to the crux of it and you could see he he felt uncomfortable he mm -hmm. laughed he didn't know how to react to real questions about the nhs i mean well, the, the, the irony is i mean the, the gordon brown encounter with uh, uh, gillian duffy mm -hmm. i remember correctly you know we all i went on telly immediately after it happened saying, well that's exactly what everyone was looking for we've been saying gordon mm. brown needs to go out and speak to speak to mm. an inverted commas real people but then of course we, we heard the conversation from the back i mean just mm. should, should politicians should frontline politicians just stay away from the public as much as is humanly possible jack well no i, I, mean, I think <laughs> I, think, I, I think if you think of the ones that you really admire uh i mean i um 
one of your colleagues actually was telling me earlier today about Mo Molum, mm. who would, you know, despite the fact that she was a Northern Ireland secretary and ill, she would always turn up in her constituents and say, right, everybody, you know, what's going mm. on? Let's have a chat about it. Mm. And um, I, I, think, I think that's, you know, that can really connect. And, and somebody who doesn't have that, I, I think, you know, in the end, it's like, I mean, unfortunately, I don't really think Keir Starmer has it. There's mm -hmm. lots of people that know Keir Starmer say he's a really great guy, he's really funny. Just just need to possibly see it a little mm -hmm. bit. But more. yeah, stop looking so worried, Keir. Mm -hmm. You know, stop, you know, if, if you look like things are going to be OK, maybe mm -hmm. we'll think they are, you know? <laughs> uh, my, my suggestion uh, for Good Week this week, uh, well, I'm going to suggest, I think it has been a, somewhat of a good week for, for, for wearers of lycra, uh, particularly the toned, <laughs> the toned and muscular uh, members of the new Gladiators team. Have you, have you guys been, like me, tuned in with your massive cotton bud, ready to, to get <laughs> no. to work? have you? Uh, no, but I think, I think I better be. It sounds yeah. like it's the, the show to watch now. I was going to say, <laughs> but, think... presumably, this, this one might just have missed you. I think it might have, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because my, my older kids are like, like 36 and 30 and and I think I watched it with them first time round because mm. I remember Jet oh, everybody yeah. fancied Jet and then was it was it Wolf Yes no one found yeah he wasn't yeah, he wasn't Wolf, quite as he hot. Was, yeah <laughs> but I mean, it, it it was extraordinary and now they've got Bradley Walsh and his son on mm. it because it's compulsory to have a father and son team on apparently <laughs> these days uh, when they're not doing travel shows and um and yeah, it's been. I mean, the ratings have been amazing, haven't they? Yeah. I mean, it's that's that's the big telly story and uh, traitors. Um, let's let, let, your suggestion for Good Week, Jan. Actually, yes. this, this is an intriguing <laughs> one for me. I've got five words here. Uh, a good week for hedgehogs. It's Explain. Been a, it's been a good week for hedgehogs because <laughs> um, yes, manufacturers of um, robot lawnmowers are conducting tests because you know hedgehogs, you know, have to encounter all sorts of hazards. Mm. Um, and uh, one of them, one of the, which is causing, you know, many, many more admissions to hedgehog uh, rehabilitation centres, is the robot lawnmower. And so now it's a good week for hedgehogs because they're conducting tests with um, crash test hedgehogs. Um, <laughs> do, they have, do they have wee helmets on? To make to make these uh, these robot um, the, these robot lawnmowers, you know, stop if they bump into a prickly little Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. <laughs> so you know, it's going to be it's all going to be okay for hedgehogs. It's good to know, isn't it? Kieran, Kieran, your thoughts on hedgehogs. No, no, yeah. don't worry, don't worry. We're going to move on, because um, I think it's probably about time we did some bad weeks here. And, and personally, you know, I've got to say, I think it, I think it has been a, an incredibly bad week um, for Fujitsu. I mean, your thoughts on what we've been hearing. Yeah, I mean, I mean the thing is, though, they, they've dodged this for a long time. It was only, it's only been the last few days, and particularly after the ITV show, um, that they've really been put under the microscope, and finally, um, I think there was one day this week where the the European chief was um, grilled by both, or Fujitsu, the company, was grilled both um, by MPs and then also at the inquiry. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the first time really that they've been put under scrutiny for what they did and then, of course, what they've covered up. Um, so, I mean, really, it's about it's about time that they did have a bad week. Mm, Jen, I mean, it's, it, it, it has been a disgrace for, for so many years and the problem is... Ultimately, someone somewhere knew, and they didn't just didn't say. Well, I think mm. a lot, a lot of them yeah. knew. A lot of them knew yeah. and didn't say. And 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 you know, the, the buck does have to stop somewhere. And as we mm. were saying earlier, I think you know the the thing now is let's just let's just get there. Let's cut to the chase. You know, let's get them and get the you know the the redress for uh, the victims. Um. And a bad week uh, for the MP and former Deputy Prime Minister at uh, Therese Coffey. This is an interesting one. Of course, during the Rwanda debate, uh, she got up to her feet uh, to criticise uh, Labour's Yvette Cooper, who had talked about dealing with the government in the capital Kigali. I was somewhat astonished by the speech of the shadow uh, Home Secretary, who can't even get the name of the country right, talking about the Kigali government. We're talking about Rwanda. You know, respect a country that has recently been president of the uh, Commonwealth. In that regard, though, Mr. Speaker. Oh, 
oh, oh, oh. Well, you know, we've all been there, and I've done it on live telly when you've oh. got something really, really daft, and you've said it on on, on this evening's programme, yeah. spot it, and you get a prize. Um, yeah. But no, no, it, it, you, I, I almost feel for her. But that is a gaff and a half. Yeah. Well, do you, I, I always think, you know, Therese Coffey is, is slightly a kind of, you know, an accident waiting to happen. You know, my, my sort of favourite <laughs> photograph of her is, you know, she's got a glass of wine in one hand and a, cig a cigar in the other and a dinner down her jumper, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I, I sort of, you know, she, she retired. She retired, apparently, from her position as Environment Secretary because uh, she was exhausted. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, well, you know it's because I was, uh, I was swimming against the tide, you know, <laughs> which, uh, since it was absolutely full of poo, you know, it was quite... <laughs> <laughs> we had a catchphrase for her, but it's just a bit of poo. But yes, to say, um, you know, Kigali. And then I heard her on PM today saying that she, you know, oh, well, I, of course I knew, I, I, knew, I knew where, I knew where, that Kigali was the capital of Rwanda. And he, but you don't say the Kigali government, you know, you just simply don't say that. And, uh, and sort of... Most of it, I mean, it, you, you really should fess up. And if you're going to be a pedant, at least be a correct pedant, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kieran, what did you make of the, the excuse? I mean, she was, as I she mean, said, I would never call the yeah, French government exactly, the, yeah. the Paris government. But she, yeah. you, you do a quick Google search, kind of yeah. a quick tweet yeah. search, and you discover that she referred to Brussels an awful lot. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I mean, that's her, that's her leader's key policy or signature policy now anyway is, is Rwanda. And she can't get the capital of that country right. I mean, and, and not even that. She then attacked the Shadow Home, mm -hmm. home, um, home Secretary for allegedly getting it wrong too. And it's just it's it's just a bit embarrassing to say that. It was the quite least. funny seeing Yvette Cooper but, and Stephen Kinnock yeah, kind of going... And trying to cover <laughs> their... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was great, wasn't it? Delicious. Uh, our final choice uh, for Bad Week this week, uh, fish and chips. Uh, Russia is threatening to abandon a treaty which allows British boats to fish in their waters, uh, which means terrible, terrible times for those who like to celebrate Fish and Chip Friday. Are you, are you offered a chippy tea after you leave here, Jan? Well, you know what? I always think Fish and Chip's always sort of, uh, you know, it seems like a good idea, and then, you know, halfway <laughs> through you sort of think, oh, God, you know... Speak for yourself. Like <laughs> but I think, I, I think, you know... I'm sort of thinking about, you know, uh, fishing boats going into... Maybe they haven't been, you know, keen to sort of go forth into Russian waters yeah. just recently anyway, I'd have thought. You know, <laughs> you know it's, yeah, it's, it's scary. All I'd suggest is just go for a battered sausage instead. You'll be absolutely fine. <laughs> right. But a deep fried pizza, also delicious. <laughs> um, Kieran, Ian, uh, thank you very much for now. We will see you again uh, in the not-too-distant. But stay where you are. Coming up after the break on Friday night, from Eastern Europe to the Middle East and Pakistan, why exactly is Iran fighting in so many so-called proxy wars around the world? We'll be asking that question next.
Welcome back. Iran is now involved in three, count them, three volatile conflicts, already supplying weapons to Hamas during their war with Israel in Gaza. This week, well, it saw them exchanging missiles across the border with Pakistan. Meanwhile, Houthi rebels are using Iranian weapons to attack tankers and warships in the Red Sea, disrupting global shipping supplies. And they remain a key supplier of heavy weapons for Russia's war in Ukraine. So what exactly is the motivation for them uh, to be fighting on so many different fronts? Uh, joining us, uh, Barar Shiban from Rusi and himself a Yemeni human rights activist. Uh, Barar, great to have you on. Um, we should probably start with, with one of the more recent events involving Iran, that, that cross-border tete-a-tete mm. uh, that seems to be going on with, with Pakistan. I mean, first and foremost, we have seen both Pakistan and Iran going into each other's territory in this kind of border region before, haven't we? So what, what is different about this occasion? Well, the thing about the, so the region is there have been, as you said, skirmishes in the past and um, both uh, sides have accused each other. So um, Pakistan have accused Iran of uh, providing sanctuary for something called the Balochistan Liberation Army. Yeah. And, uh, and, and on the other side, this Jaysh al Adil, um, Iran accuses Pakistan of providing sanctuary for, uh, for, uh, for them. Let's say they don't fully trust each other, but they have more of a uh, an understanding, a workable relationship in how to de-escalate that uh, that uh, that border. But and things have changed, it would seem. Definitely, uh, definitely. And I think if I mean. Neil, if you're someone like me, you've been following the Middle East quite closely. Mm -hmm. This came as a surprise because Iran seems to be it has its hands full in the in the in the region already. So it came as a surprise that actually it decided suddenly mm -hmm. to antagonize Pakistan with these uh, with these uh, with these uh, with these strikes. But Iran looks like it wants to show everyone that it can fight on multiple fronts at the same time. It can uh, provide weapons to the Houthis in Yemen. It can actually support Hezbollah yeah. by the Israeli-Lebanese border. And it can, at the same time, do preemptive strife against uh, any potential threats that can threaten the, uh, uh, the uh, border, whether, yeah. whether it comes from Pakistan or even uh, the, the last two days they started uh, launching strikes in Iraq and in Syria. Well, that, that, that was the point I was going to make. I mean, if you want a demonstration of Iran's reach right now, the fact that they're firing off missiles at Iraq and Syria Syria, whilst the Pakistan situation is gone going, whilst there are uh, presumably conversations ongoing with Yemen and uh, Lebanon as well. So, so ultimately, what are they doing? Is this just saber rattling? Because it, it feels a little bit more pointed than that. Well, it's the the, the, the thing. Iran says that actually it has, for, for, for many years, it has mm. accused that Israel and the US are providing some support for this, for, for Jaysh al Adil. Mm -hmm. uh, it had tried to speak with the Pakistanis for quite a long time that they need to de escalate. And they seem that things were going to, 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 to quiet down. Also, Balochistan, this area, it has the important port of Gawadir, which actually the Chinese have invested a huge amount of uh, investment into, uh, into that as part of their Belt and Road Initiative. So it, it, it didn't make sense that actually it would start escalating on the Pakistani-Iranian border, except if Iran wants to send a message that actually I am capable of doing this, I am ready to fight on multiple fronts at the same time. But, but, but ever since, ever since the, 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 the war in Gaza started, yeah. everyone has been talking, has been using one word, contagion. And it seems, it, it, it seems almost as if Iran is not simply happy for contagion to take place and for the conflict to spread, but it seems to be actively trying to seed it. Well, Iran has been trying to play a very delicate balance. Mm. It supports a network of uh, militant groups, non-state actors in the region. They uh, want to have that regional influence, yet at the same time not taking full responsibility for the actions of those groups. We name it uh, the Houthis or uh, or Hezbollah, amongst many other uh, um, uh, other militant groups. But it looks like this dance has gone for too long, mm. and it looks like it's lipping. Things are, might spill over any uh, any moment. I think the region is more than any time this close to a, a, a bigger conflict. Um, let's just bring the panel in at this point. I mean, Jan, Kieran, I mean, what, what do you make of all this? I'm, 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 I am generally a kind of a glass half empty guy at the best of times, but when you see Iran acting in this kind of fashion, the prospect of a wider conflict than that which we already have just seems to me to be becoming even more realistic. Yeah, and it's, it's obviously quite frightening too. And, and as you mentioned, Iran sort of have their fingers in all these different areas. I mean, it's, it's Hezbollah, it's Hamas, it's the Houthi rebels. And it all is happening at the same time too. And you do wonder again, what, what will be the end game here? What are they trying to achieve? Because the more they push, the more likely there will be pushback. And then do they do they spark a, 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 wider, um, a wider conflict? And you know, you've had the US and the UK 
going back into the Red Sea and starting to uh, launch missiles as well. So it, it raises fears about how far this will this will go. Jan, just a, just a final word from you, briefly. If you well, can. I just find it really scary. I mean, it's not my area of expertise at all. And 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 like you, I'm kind of wondering what what their what their end game is. Do, do they do they sort of want you know world domination, or do they want world destruction? You know, what what possible let's, kind let's, of end result is? Do you know what? Do you know what? Let's let's keep our fingers crossed. Let's go back that to Hedge Fox. <laughs> <laughs> Hedge on that. Uh, Bara. Kieran, uh, Jan, thank you all so much for your contributions this evening. Really, really appreciate your time. Uh, we, however, have to take a very short break, but coming up in the sport, more history for my hero, the teenage dart sensation Luke Littler throwing a nine darter before winning the Bahrain Masters. We'll cover that after this. I'm Katie Spencer and I'm Sky News' arts and entertainment correspondent. As a team, we've interviewed some of the biggest stars in the world, the likes of Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, Sir Elton John. We try to give you an honest sense of how these people really are. David Blevins and I'm Sky's senior Ireland correspondent. I'm based in Belfast, a city transformed by peace but still struggling with its past. Politically, the two sides are as far apart as ever and it's over that question of who has sovereignty in Northern Ireland, the very issue that's been the source of tension here for generations. It takes 60 minutes to cross the Irish Sea. It took the British monarchy a century. I've spent 25 years reporting the journey from conflict to peace. The political parties of Northern Ireland have reached agreement. We help you understand the world with us. Today, we have reached an agreement with the Conservative Party on support for government in Parliament. We already know what the government gets out of this deal. What exactly does the DUP get out of it? Well, 1.5 billion pounds. <laughs> Welcome to Winterfell. It's an iconic location in this globally acclaimed drama. Ophelia was the most powerful hurricane this far east in the Atlantic on record. Oh you can't live in a place like this and not appreciate the environment. Uh, time for the latest sports news. Dave Fulton standing by at Sky Sports News. Dave, there's only one story in town for me <laughs> this evening. The hero, the absolute genius that is, the teenage dart sensation Luke Littler. Yeah, it's amazing, Neil, isn't it? What a month he's had, you know, the final of the uh, World Championship. I think he earned £200,000, which is not bad when you still haven't hit 17. 17 <laughs> in two days' time. He's now gone on to win uh, the Bahrain Masters, and he also threw a nine data. Let's take a little look at this, because he came close in the World Championship, didn't manage it, but uh, this was him checking out. You could see what it meant to him. Brilliant stuff. And, uh, obviously, that was against Nathan Aspinall, and very gracious with his applause. And uh, everyone's just a fan of Luke the Nuke, can't they? He went on to beat Gerwin Price in the semi-final, former world champion Price, and then former world champion Michael Van Gerwen in the final, as you can see here, just closing out the tournament. 20 grand was all he won for this tournament, so I reckon in two days' time, when he turns 17, he can buy himself a decent car and, uh, yeah, enjoy it. Let's hope it doesn't go completely to his head, because I could imagine a lot of 16-year-olds with this kind of success might struggle with it, but good luck to him. What a star.
totally. But but do you not get the impression, just from listening to him in interviews and the way in which he has handled the pressure? And let's be fair, a big old stage, both at both at um, both at Ali Pali and indeed now winning the Barry and Masters. I mean, it just strikes me that I just what I don't want is for him to burn out, for there to be all this interest in him, and then for you know for the yips to come in. Yeah, well, look, hopefully the yips won't come in. But, yeah, it's a lot to take in at, at that young age. But I think he's got some good people around him. And even the darts community, we saw there Nathan Aspinall delighted with his nine darter. Gary Anderson had some kind of words of caution. Let the lad play uh, in, the, in, the, in the World Darts Championship. So I think that the darts community also wants to see this guy carry on. He's great for the game. He's great for the, the PR side of the game. And um, he's, he's bringing more eyeballs to it. So I think they, they want to look after him. But, look, it's a, it's a lot to handle. Let's hope he continues to go for from success to success. I'm just speaking more, more generally about the sport and, and the state of it at the moment. I mean, to be fair, the, you know, the, the, the professionalism, the move away from Lakeside, where, you know, the sticky carpets and all the rest of it, to, <laughs> to the big events that we're seeing on the professional darts tour at the moment. I mean, it, it's a real spectator sport. And I've been along and I have watched it and I, I genuinely dare anyone to go along and not have a good time. Yeah, I mean, there were one or two. Guys. It's not a real sport, is it? But it is. I mean, there's there's skill um, and, and there's if jeopardy. If cricket's a sport, darts is a sport. If you can wear a jumper now, and it's yourself. a sport, I'm sorry. Now, <laughs> <laughs> what I would say is that there's there's jeopardy. Every few minutes, there's jeopardy. You know, the the, the, the legs move on at a pace um, and the crowd really get into it. So it's, it, it, it's, it's huge and you need the next generation of superstars to come along and this guy's right at the forefront. Certainly, you certainly do. Uh, plenty more sports, so let's have a look at it. Thanks, Lee. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Two thousand and twenty-four will mark the return of the Olympic Games to Europe for the first time since London 2012. Team GB sprinters have an enviable strength in depth, but only three male and three female sprinters can compete in the individual events. Eugene Amodadzi is one of a number of British sub-10 second 100 metre male sprinters. He's a little bit different though. Yeah, a late starter, very late in fact. He began just five years ago, narrowly missing out on the World Championship 100 metre final last summer at the age of 31. He's getting faster though and that's all the more incredible as before he began sprinting he'd forged himself a career. Meet the world's fastest accountant. Right now I, I still don't refer to myself as a sprinter. I'm just a chartered accountant. The world's <laughs> fastest accountant, that's what I like to call myself. <laughs> Great, every penny, every little helps, right? That's what that's what people think accountants are. I'm unbelievably proud of my accountant qualification. You know, my parents pushed me to, you know, go to school, do well, get good grades, um, and qualify, you know, as something. Being from a like, West African household, it was called like doctor, lawyer, engineer, um, accountant. So I guess I went down that route. So I'm incredibly proud of it, um, and you know, I've had those aspirations of climbing the corporate ladder. Ooh. How, how, do you, how, how far do you reckon it is from here to there? About 100 metres? Yeah. <laughs> I always used to, to sort of test myself little trivial things like I've got two minutes to make the train, I reckon I can make it if I just go for it. And I'm like, surely I'm the only person who can actually do this. So you've always been competitive? I'll, yeah, I'll take it like, to anything. I just want to win. My best friend's name is Ben. So. <laughs> and so emerged somewhat later than is normal. Eugene is 31 after school. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. A uh, little bit of breaking news before the weather regarding the, the indictment in the United States of Alec Baldwin on a charge of involuntary manslaughter and, of course, related to the death of uh, Halnia Hutchins. Um, we have now had a statement from their lawyers, sorry, from the lawyers of her parents, in fact. Uh, our, cli our clients have always sought the truth about what happened on that day, that she was shot and killed on October the 21st, 2021. They continue to seek the truth in our civil lawsuit for them, and they would also like there to be accountability in the criminal justice system. The grand jury has decided there is sufficient evidence to indict Alec Baldwin on the charge of involuntary manslaughter. We are looking forward to the criminal trial, which will determine if he should be ultimately uh, convicted, sorry, if he should be convicted for the untimely death of Halnia.
um, of course, that, that the statement uh, from the family of the deceased. We will, I expect, over the coming days, uh, hear from, from Alec Baldwin himself. Uh, but very soon we will be having another conversation with our US correspondent, James Matthews, to put a little bit of complexion on that story. But as promised, time for a quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. And it's all changed this weekend as snow and ice are replaced by wind and rain with the arrival of Storm Isha on Saturday. Uh, sorry, Sunday, I should say. Uh, most places dry this evening, though, although wintry showers will continue in the far north. Meanwhile, Western Ireland will turn cloudy and windy as a band of rain approaches. Cloud and rain will spread across Ireland into Northern Ireland and Scotland overnight with an ice risk and some hill snow. Much of England and Wales will be cold and clear with patchy freezing fog. After a pretty cold start in the southeast, uh, most places are in for a breezy day with spells of rain erratically moving eastwards, heaviest over western hills. It will be much milder in the strong southwesterly wind with a risk of gales through the Irish Sea. As for the best of any brighter spells, well, those will be across eastern England and northeast Scotland. A band of heavy and persistent rain moving into the west later. Sunday, much milder, wetter and windier as Storm Isha arrives. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Stay where you are. Coming up next, we will, of course, be discussing Fujitsu once again. Welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. This is the show where we take all the news, the good bits and the bad, and dissect them for your entertainment. We also want to hear what you think about the stories making the headlines and going viral this week. Later this hour, we will have the details on what to watch on TV, at the cinema and the theatre, including what our critic calls the maddest film I have ever seen. Stay tuned. At first tonight, our top stories. <coughs> And Tata Steel has confirmed plans to close two blast furnaces at its steelworks in Port Talbot, with the loss of up to 2,800 jobs. 
Shameful and appalling, Fujitsu's Europe boss on the editing of witness statements to defend the post office IT system. A grand jury indicts the actor Alec Baldwin on a charge of involuntary manslaughter over a fatal shooting on a film set. And Japan becomes the fifth country to set down a spacecraft on the moon, but not without some jeopardy for this lunar landing. Also tonight, our sports presenter Jackie Beltrao has been having a chat with one particular big unit. Can Anthony Joshua complete his comeback and once more be crowned heavyweight champion of the world? Jackie Belter joining us just a little later. And if you're wondering what to watch this weekend, Rebecca Jones has been in the studio with suggestions from the worlds of TV, theatre and film, including Emma Stone in Poor Things, which has already picked up a tonne of awards. Great to have your company. We are here until 10 o'clock. Hold on tight. It's Friday night. Evening all, the news a community knew was coming but was still devastating when it arrived. Thousands of jobs are likely to be lost after Tata Steel confirmed it is closing two blast furnaces at its plant in Port Talbot, South Wales. Well, the decision has left steel workers angry and frustrated, but Tata insists the move is necessary to not only make the plant commercially viable, but also have a significant effect on reducing the UK's carbon emissions. Well, let's run you through the numbers and the big headline figure to start with. 2,800 jobs are expected to go, 2,500 in the next 18 months, a further 300 taking the total to 2,800 uh, because of those additional losses expected in coming years. But the government and Tata have committed more than a billion pounds to transform Port Talbot into a greener, more sustainable steel producer. Our correspondent Adele Robinson reports now from South Wales. This is more than an iconic skyline for Port Talbot. Without this steelworks behind us, we'll be absolutely like a ghost town. It represents a century of steelmaking. Devastated, desperate, uncertain, and overnight, to be perfectly honest, very hungry. And the lives intertwined with it. Now all that will disappear with the closure of two blast furnaces and the loss of 2,800 jobs. Gary's been here for 37 years. It's a way of life. We are steel men and women. We know nothing else. Empty, heartbroken feeling, to be honest with you. We, we, there's no one in, in this town and the surrounding communities who has done have someone involved in this. What are we going to do? And Andrew's dad worked here like him too. Emotionally, I, I'm a third generation. And to me, we've all got a tie to it. Even though I'm from the valleys, I, I'm a steel worker is in my blood. That is part of the heritage. 100 years of steel making is about to end you unless we stop it. Part of plans to cut emissions. A new electric arc furnace will make no longer new, but recycled steel from scrap. A financial decision, say the Indian owners Tata Steel, as well as a green one. It's a difficult day. We uh, appreciate that. I think we've had these conversations with the unions, particularly over the last four months. Uh, uh, they're not happy with the outcome, that's clear. We do believe that the proposed way forward is the best way forward to secure the future of the site. And with money from the UK government to help. We are absolutely committed to steel making in the UK and that's why the government provided half a billion pounds to support Tata. The alternative, by the way, was that the entire plant would be closed and all 8,000 jobs would be lost. This community exists because of these blast furnaces and for multiple generations it's all they've known. But it's not just about the people here, it's about the future of UK steel making. Tata Steel argue that their plans help secure that. Unions say the opposite. They're worried the UK will become more reliant on imports, but the more immediate concern, decimating a community. If our members tell us they want to take industrial action, then that's what we'll do. They've got kids, all they want to do is feed their family and, and have a good life, and that's being taken away from them. So how much is the sentiment, we will not accept this? We, we won't. Yeah, we have no option but to fight. If we have to, we will. We hope Tata will change their mind. We hope the government will put more money in. A piece of steel-making history is about to be lost here that was perhaps inevitable. Nobody can imagine this place not being here. It's not in the community. This place is the community. For unions, the fight is far from over. Adele Robinson, Sky News, Port Talbot. 
The European boss of Fujitsu has told the Post Office Inquiry that he has seen evidence of staff witness statements being edited to remove mentions of the bugs and errors that plagued the Horizon accounting system, which of course led to the wrongful convictions of hundreds of sub-postmasters. Paul Patterson said it was shameful and appalling that those being prosecuted were not told that the company knew about Horizon's issues. Sky's Ivor Bennett was at the inquiry. If Fujitsu was hoping this would shift the spotlight, they may be disappointed. Answers that led to more questions. Is saying sorry enough? Is saying sorry I've just, enough? Uh, I've just given uh, quite an extensive evidence to the inquiry. We've got some follow-up to do. We're going to be doing that and uh, make sure that we follow through. Thank you. Is saying sorry enough? Exactly. Why haven't you met any sub-postmasters yet? You've been in the job for five years. Are you proud to work for Fujitsu? It was Paul Patterson's second time in the hot seat this week, and as he did to MPs, he began by apologising. Fujitsu designed the faulty Horizon system, and its bugs, we now know, were shared with the post office, and Fujitsu knew about them from the start. All the bugs and errors have been known, at one, one level or not, for many, many years, um, right from the very start of um, deployment of, uh, of this system. There were bugs and errors and defects. Which were, which were well known. It was an extraordinary admission. Problems with the system the post office treated as sacrosanct for many years after. But it wasn't as extraordinary as what came next. Paul Patterson told this room that witness statements were edited to remove references to the bugs. And these were witness statements given by Fujitsu staff and used in the prosecutions of sub-postmasters, innocent victims who were denied a fair trial because the evidence was incomplete. And I uh, no doubt you would regard that as shameful. I would, yes, that would be one word I would use. What's the other one? Um, shameful, appalling. Um, my understanding of how our laws work in this country, um, that all of the evidence should have been put in front of the sub postmaster that the post office was relying on to prosecute them. Horizon Helpline, thank you for waiting. Lee Castleton is one of the heroes of the ITV drama, a former sub-postmaster made bankrupt after being taken to court and pursued for more than £300,000. They should hang their heads in shame, the whole lot of them really. They've, they've conspired to prosecute people for 20 years and it's, it's still, the prosecution's are ongoing but the prosecution's still standing. But where Fujitsu said sorry, only silence from those who were at the post office. This was Angela Vanden Bogard, a former top boss. But the cameras and the questions aren't going away. Ivor Bennett, Sky News. Uh, more on the news that's been breaking this evening. In the last, hour, uh, last couple of hours, I should say, a grand jury in the United States has indicted the actor Alec Baldwin over a fatal shooting on a film set in New Mexico. He now faces a charge of involuntary manslaughter. Uh, let's bring in our US correspondent, uh, James Matthews, for more on this story. And James, just, just explain a little bit of the background to this, because of course we, we have now been hearing from the, from the lawyers acting uh, for the families of the deceased. Yeah, that's right, uh, Neil. I mean, here's the stuff of Hollywood, the reality of the filming of this Western movie, Rust. Uh, almost overshadows the, the plot line that we will see on our screens because they have gone back to, to filming this movie. It's still in uh, production. What's happened today is that its lead star and co-producer Alec Baldwin uh, has been charged once more with involuntary manslaughter. He'd been charged previously, but that charge was dropped. The events, of course, are about uh, the filming on the set in October 2021. Baldwin was rehearsing in the company of Helena Hutchins, a cinematographer and the movie's director. In his hand, Alec Baldwin held a pistol, a gun. Now, he says he had his... Uh, he had pulled back the hammer. That's the, the part of the weapon typically pulled back by the thumb. He says he did not pull the trigger. But what happened then was that the gun went off and a live bullet was fired killing Helena Hutchins and wounding the director who was nearby. Now, prosecutors, they tested, they carried out tests on this weapon. They were told that 
it, there was possibly a malfunction because it had been modified. That was a key reason behind dropping the charges. But they had a second look at the weapon. It was subject to tests, and these fresh tests uh, concluded that the trigger must have been pulled. Markings on a ca spent cartridge told them as much, and that's why Alec Baldwin is back in the frame, charged by grand jury with involuntary manslaughter. He's not the only one connected to that film facing a similar charge. The weapons supervisor uh, has been charged, indicted on involuntary manslaughter. Her trial starts in February. We have not heard from Alec Baldwin in response to these fresh charges, but his lawyers have spoken briefly only to say, we look forward to our day in court. James, for now. Thanks very much indeed. Now, the UK Health Security Agency has warned that rates of measles vaccinations are well below the level set by the World Health Organization. The agency has now declared a national incident over a disease which is far more contagious than COVID. There's certainly been a sharp recent rise in cases in the West Midlands, as Becky Johnson now reports. Ellie Roscoe has been left with ongoing health problems after becoming seriously ill with measles. I thought we wouldn't get through it. That, that's, that's the truth. Um, she was delirious. Her body was covered in the rash, which you couldn't touch her skin. She wasn't fully vaccinated as a child. Her mother had been concerned that the MMR jab caused autism, a health scare that's since been disproven. Am I risking measles or autism? And I thought at the time that the autism was far worse than the measles. It was me and my situation. With having gone through measles, if I was having children, I would vaccinate them um, because it is a dreadful illness. They live in Birmingham, which has seen the largest number of cases in this recent outbreak. Schools have been urging parents to get children vaccinated. I think if, you, if you've got the children vaccinated, um, we should be quite safe, isn't it? I think parents that haven't have got something to worry about. Parts of London, too, have seen a rise in cases. This child's mother didn't want to be identified, but told us why she won't let her children have the vaccine. I do not like it. The ingredients had in there, the stuff they had in there, and after actually researching and seeing many stories of how parents have actually vaccinated their kids and seen how it actually affected them. MMR vaccine uptake has fallen right across the country. We're being warned measles could spread across other towns and cities. The number of cases has grown so rapidly that the UK Health Security Agency has now declared a national incident, meaning they'll focus resources on trying to limit the outbreak and targeting those most at risk. This lab in Birmingham is where all the latest cases are being confirmed. So they will be very different and I think cultural or religious or other reasons why people have not been vaccinated to this point. Now, some of them may not have been offered it. So, for example, a refugee from a country may never have been offered a vaccination. But health officials face a combination of misinformation, cultural and religious concerns and post-pandemic vaccine hesitancy. Becky Johnson, Sky News, Birmingham. Japan made history today after successfully landing a spacecraft on the moon, becoming only the fifth country to make it all the way to the lunar surface. However, despite touching down on the moon, it wasn't a complete success. Japanese space officials revealed that the moon sniper is not producing the electricity needed for it to continue operating beyond the lifespan of its batteries. And you know what, I suspect that story will be featuring pretty prominently in tomorrow's papers. And we, of course, have our extended press preview and news review from half past ten this evening. Tonight's news and tomorrow's headlines. Uh, joining Gillian Joseph will be the Daily Mirror columnist, Susie Boniface, and the deputy editor of Conservative Home, Henry Hill. Coming up next here on Friday night... The former heavyweight champion Anthony Joshua tells Jackie Beltrow the fight that every boxing fan wants to see is taking place in Saudi Arabia. That's next.
So there's a large number of companies or supposed companies advertising on there, a lot of people offering too good to be true deals, mm. and it's just going to become more and more common because it makes it possible. So a key thing, never give any money before you have the goods. That's probably the most important thing. Anyone who says, oh, just give me this and I'll get it to you, it's not going to happen. Uh, on top of that, anything where it doesn't fit the secondhand market value anyone selling on facebook marketplace they've got access to the internet as well obviously they know what's a reasonable price for it if they're charging a third of that there's a reason why scams are fraud a lot of these marketplaces they they give a new a new venue for fraudsters that's yeah. really what they're doing is legislation for this, but it was years ago that action fraud was found not fit for purpose. We know that prosecutions for fraud are incredibly low. So, yes, I would say Facebook should be doing more about this, but it's important to note to do that, they would need to be doing more to check people's identities, and that's something where there's other issues that come in. So there's action fraud that you can report it to, but they won't be able to do much unless it's significant enough to hit law enforcement. There is a charity out there called the Cyber Helpline, and they can give some advice and some support to individuals who are caught. But frankly, there's not much you can do. Uh, one of the best things to do is make sure that you are paying with a credit card because then you can dispute the charges. And if anyone's not willing to take a credit card payment, there are some serious questions you should be asking. Welcome back. Saudi Arabia, well, it continues to disrupt global sport and today has seen a series of big announcements. World Snooker has announced its first championship in Riyadh in March and this most traditional game will totally change its rules with a so-called golden ball, allowing players to make a maximum 1-6-7 break. Uh, it's not all good news, however. In football, England's midfielder Jordan Henderson has signed for the Dutch side Ajax after less than six months playing in the Saudi league. But it is boxing, where the Middle East country is really shaking things up. Sky's Jackie Beltrow is here to tell us more. Jackie, lovely to see you. Hello. You've been you've been speaking to two of the two of the biggest names ahead of a, a, a what I think is going to be an absolutely classic fight, but being held in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, two of the biggest names and also the biggest guys in yeah. Ghana, who's new on the scene. He UFC scares me. He's very, very large. And he's wearing traditional Cameroonian dress when I met him, so he's even larger. And AJ, who's always, you know, mm. he's just a very big presence of a man. But you're right, it's really shaken up boxing. But in a good way, it's, it's got, got it out of its apathy that it went through during COVID a little bit. You know, people were avoiding each other. And there was a lot of lack of activity, especially in the heavyweight division. And it stopped totally. all that because... Suddenly, there's all this money on the table, and it's huge money, and everybody wants a piece of that cake. So AJ against Ngannou, 
I said to him at the start of this interview, this is a cash grab, isn't it? There's no way you would have boxed a novice unless it was in Saudi and unless it was for a fabulous purse. And he said, do you know what? In boxing, they're all cash grabs. Mm. That's what it's all about. That's what they fight for. Finite apart career. Apart from the belts, it's all about the money, isn't mm. it? It's all about the money. Um, but he feels that having had three wins recently, last year, He's right at the back, at back at the top of the conversation. I mean, he said he never went away, mm. but you know, for mm. a little bit after two defeats at Usyk, you could argue that he did. But he's right back up there. Let's have a listen. You want to be back in the conversation at the top of heavyweight boxing? I am at the top. Yeah, I was going to say. Do you think you're back in that conversation? I've never left. I'll always be from the minute I laced up these gloves. From the amateurs till now, I've made, managed to keep my name at the top of the amateur scene and the professional scene. <laughs> it's just the truth. <laughs> just how it is, and I think it'll be that way until I don't want to fight anymore. Will there be less UK fights with you going forward? Because That's a good question. the Saudi money has just changed everything, hasn't it? So will you fight again in the UK? The Saudi money, it's interesting. It has, though. Come yeah, on, Yeah, I'm looking because it it's a great opportunity. Like, if I fought in America, would I fight in America again? Yeah. Fought in Saudi a few times, would I fight there again? Yeah. And would I fight in the UK? Yeah, I would. But it's interesting because when will I fight back in the UK is a question. That is a question. Yeah. When will you fight in the UK? <clears throat> Maybe the fight after this one. Maybe after March the 8th, we'll probably make a return back to the UK because um, especially that Riyadh season will be done. So, yeah, we'll have a good window where we can get some fights in in the UK, uh, possibly. Do belts even matter anymore? To me, the belts matter to me. Yeah, or in boxing generally. Do the yeah. belts matter? Is it all about just making matches? I think that there is that element as well, because for the fans at home, they just want to see matches at the same time. It's like, I don't care, just get the fight done. Like, you know, they say, like, I don't care about the promoters, I don't care about all that, ish, all that stuff. Just get the fights done. So there is that element, but you will never know what it's like and what it feels like to be a champion until you become one. And for me, belts will always matter because it's something that you set your goals out to achieve as a, as a little kid. And if you're like a tennis fan, you win your trophy, footballs, you win a your footballer, you win a trophy, boxing, you win a title. It's quite similar across all sports. Is like, what's the prize at the end? And um, I think boxing will always, even though we want to see the fights, the title in boxing will always be um, prestige. What about Tyson Fury? Do you think you'll ever fight him? Will that fight ever happen while you're still both in reasonably good condition? Yeah, 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 reasonably good. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, it's true. I wish it did. I'm sure it will, though. But, you know, uh, God has his plans. But, and I'm sure that Tyson Fury is part of God's plan in my life. You fought Usyk twice. Who wins this fight, Usyk against uh, Fury? I don't want to say, I don't Come know. Come on, you've fought him twice, Usyk. you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think he does. I mean, he's, a, he's a really good fighter. And I've never fought Tyson Fury to know anyway, you know. I've never fought him to actually know how good he is. But from what I've experienced with Usyk, I fought him on two different occasions and he boxed differently in both. So I think he has a good chance because he's able to adapt. And what about Nganu? How do you look against him? Who wins that? I win it, but like anything, I think it's going to be a challenging fight. So in my head, I'm taking myself to a place where I know if it gets tough and if it gets rough, I'm ready, like, from a cellular level. You know, every cell in my body will know to keep on pushing through and not, not give in at all. So, um, I, and that will lead me to victory for sure. Do you know what? I think that may well be a fight that I'm uh, tuning into. But whilst we have you, this, this, this rare pleasure of having you at this time on a Friday, Jackie, th there are a couple of other stories that have been kicking around that I think it would be good to get, get your views on. And, and one of them, of course, involving another social media spat, Joey Barton and Eniola, uh, Eniola Aluko. What on earth is going on this time? Well, I think Joey Barton's trying to make his point and ram it home that he doesn't think female... Uh, football pundits should be commentating on male matches, on Champions League matches or, you know, World Cup or whatever. He just I, doesn't think that female football and, and, and male football is, is a similar game at all. I thought we got past that point 20-odd years ago. Well, he doesn't think so and he mm. thinks it's tokenism. Um, the way he loses his argument, though, you're entitled to your own opinion, mm. right? But the way he loses it is he becomes personally insulting to Enya Luko. Mm. And, you know, when you call someone Rose West, for example, you are going to lose the... Your, whatever argument you had, you've already lost. But 
I don't think he's got a decent argument to begin with, because if that was the case, you could have you could never have a female pundit talking about male sport ever. ever. So if you had, for example, Serena Williams was offered up as a pundit to commentate on the men's final at Wimbledon, you would take her in an instant. All day, you? every day. Even though Serena Williams would probably wouldn't even know what it's like to play male tennis. She wouldn't even be able to beat the the hundredth ranked player, male player in the world. So would you stand her down and go, let's take the hundredth ranked player let's, instead? Let's you get Joey Barton in to talk about you, it. You wouldn't. Um, so I don't really know what his argument is. It's just, mm. you know, the rules are the same. The insights are going to be the same. And people make mistakes when they're starting out in their, in their broadcasting career. They say silly stuff. And, you know, males have been saying stupid stuff about football for absolutely <laughs> decades. Chris since, Tamara is Since, since the first favorite. ball was kicked, presumably. Yeah, yeah. Chris Tamara is one of my absolute faves. We love him as a pundit. Mm -hmm. And he can stand there and talk to Jeff Stelling and say, um, not sure when the goal was scored, and Jeff went, oh, and you th they've had a man sent off. Have they? <laughs> I, I, I thought he was just walking to the touchline. <laughs> if that had been a female pundit, can you imagine the uproar? I think, I think, I think that, is a, that is a very fair point. Um, but look, some, some sad news emerging from, from one of those sporting worlds that I know that is very close to your heart, the world of tennis. Uh, w one of the one of the finer journalists working on the game. Tell us a little bit about Mike Dixon. So Mike Dixon was a tennis correspondent for the Mail, and he was out in Australia covering the Australian Open, as he does all the Grand Slams, all the tennis. He follows it around the world, and that group of tennis journalists are very small. There's very few of them that go to everything, mm. and he was one of them, of course. Um, and he died while he was he was working. He one day he was writing and, and tweeting and writing about Emma Raducanu's match and he collapsed and died in Australia. So far from home, so tragic, just a few days short of his 60th birthday. But what a fine journalist. It's great that you're, you're highlighting you know, his work because a brilliant journalist just managed to capture a story and all facets of it so beautifully. In fact, he wrote about Andy Murray's match where he lost in the first round of the Aussie Open the other day. And it was such a good piece referencing where Andy Murray was at and perhaps it was the end and all this. I've kept it for reference. It was such a good piece. I met him years ago and the LTA asked uh, me to help coach Laura Robson, who was 14 at the time and about to go into junior Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. let's, talk, let's talk about media training. And they also asked him to do um, from, a, from a written perspective as well. And it was interesting that they would choose him. Of and they did. And, I met him, I thought, he, I thought he doesn't like me, he's a little bit grumpy, but it was almost like you had to prove yourself yeah. to him. And then he was the most fantastic man. Uh, well, our condolences and, and best wishes to, to his friends and family. Uh, mm -hmm. Jackie, always lovely to see you. Thanks very much for being with us. Time for us to have a quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. All changed this weekend as snow and ice are replaced by wind and rain with the arrival of Storm Isha on Sunday. Uh, this evening, though, most places dry, although wintry showers will continue in the far north. Meanwhile, Western Ireland will turn cloudy and windy as a band of rain approaches. Cloud and rain will indeed spread across Ireland into Northern Ireland and Scotland overnight with an ice risk and some hill snow. Much of England and Wales will be cold and clear with patchy freezing fog. After a cold start in the southeast, most places in for a breezy day with spells of rain moving eastwards. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Coming up next on Friday night with me, Neil Patterson, we'll be discussing what to watch. Uh, Rebecca Jones talking about the Oscar frontrunner that could well be the maddest film you've ever seen.
welcome back. Saudi Arabia, well, it continues to disrupt global sport and today has seen a series of big announcements. World Snooker has announced its first championship in Riyadh in March and this most traditional game will totally change its rules with a so-called golden ball, I have to say. Plenty to do on into it. Um, poor things in the cinema at the latest Emma Stone vehicle. This has got to be one of the weirdest films I've ever seen. <laughs> that's presum and presumably that's saying something as well. Uh, well, yeah, maybe. I mean, this is, what can I say, a feminist spin on Frankenstein. So basically, Emma Stone plays a woman called Bella Baxter mm -hmm. who takes her own life. She's then brought back to life by an experimental scientist who implants the brain of her unborn baby into her own brain. Are you following this? Not really. <laughs> And basically, you've therefore got a grown woman's body mm -hmm. with a brain of a baby. And at the beginning of the film, she behaves like a baby. So she smashes plates and hits people and spits out her food. But as the film progresses, she embarks, I guess, on a journey of self-discovery, shall we say. Shall we, shall we have a flavour of it, Nick? Let's have a look. These two are fighting and ideas are banging around in Bella's head and heart like lights in a storm. Oh. You're always reading now, Bella. You're losing some of your adorable way of speaking. I'm a changingable feast, as are all of we. Apparently, according to Emerson, disagreed with by Harry. Come, come, just come. You're in my son. What? Very distinctive visually, but I've got to say it's, it's the cast list that really does it for me. And just and on the on the basis of that trailer as well, Emma Stone flanked by I mean two actors who command the screen every time they're on it, Mark Ruffalo and Willem Dafoe. Yeah, I mean Emma Stone, we've got a shout out for her. She is fantastic in mm. this film. She's already won a Golden Globe, nominated for a BAFTA, almost certainly will win an Oscar for this performance. And because basically she goes from having the brain of a baby to, mm. to growing up and becoming a woman. Astonishing performance, hats off to her. Willem Dafoe, terrific in it. Mark Ruffalo, of course, a lot of people will remember him as the Hulk course, in yeah. the Avengers. Uh, slightly dodgy accents, both of them, but we'll forgive them that, they're terrific in it. And as you say, it's visual stunning yeah. and so imaginative. You know, you've got chickens with the faces of dogs and airships floating around. I mean, it's... Yes, you were selling it to me. <laughs> now it's getting slightly... No, 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 run with, it, run with it. It's fantastic. Brilliant. One on my list. Um, in a bit of a change, we're going to stick with the life after death theme mm. for a little, um, but it's actually in the theatre. And this is um, The Enfield Haunting. Tell us a little bit about it. It's based on a true story. It is based on a true story. Stars Catherine Tate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, incredible true story for those people that perhaps don't remember it or want reminding. Back in the late 1970s, uh, a single mother is living in an ordinary house in Enfield in North London and she reports things that go bang in the night. So furniture's moving, odd things are happening, strange men's voices are coming out of the mouths of her daughter. And, and this becomes national and international news. The police descend on the house, journalists, even paranormal investigators. And the bottom line is mm -hmm. nobody knows whether this is a hoax or whether the house really has got a poltergeist. Uh, it's been inspired documentaries. You can imagine there's a new one on Apple TV at the moment, a film, mm -hmm. Hollywood film, The Conjuring 2. I think it was actually a sky drama right. back in 2015 starring Timothy Spall, mm -hmm. and now it's a play. Let's have a look.
I mean, we, we talked about the cast list for, for poor things. The cast list for a, The Enfield Haunting, Catherine Tate and David Threlfo, again, two fantastic actors. And I've long been a fan of Catherine Tate, but the way in which she has been able to channel those kind of comedy chops into to serious drama has been something wonderful to watch, from, from my perspective anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're turning up to this and expecting her to be Donna in Doctor Who mm. or Nan, uh, you'll be surprised. And I think a lot of people will go to see this because of her. I have to tell you, Neil, I have never, never seen such a bad set of reviews. Really? I mean, I have to oh, give no. you a, a, a taste. Go for it. Uh, <laughs> one critic has called this a candidate already for the worst play of the year, and we're only in January. Uh, another said it was a snooze fest oh. and crushingly bad. Oh, dear. Um, it, it's not great, mm -hmm. and I, I'm trying to work out why, and I think the bottom line is, it's just not scary enough. So although the, the curtains billow a mm. bit and the pipes knock a bit and furniture moves around a bit, they then kind of stop and have a bit of a chat mm. and it's a bit limp. So, uh, but people will go. People will go and see it because of Catherine Tate. And actually, maybe because the reviews are like that, they'll be interested to go and see it. Do you know what, if, if people are looking for something to watch with Poltergeist in it, do you remember that old BBC thing? They did it as live with Craig Charles and um, uh, Michael Parkinson. Yeah, yeah. Ghost Watch, it's out there. Go watch it, oh, scare you silly. Um, a lot then, riding on your final choice, um, coming from the world of television this yeah. time, I, I, and one that is very, very close to my heart. Um, this is the, what, the fourth season yeah. uh, now of True Detective. It is. So it's worth saying, so True Detective is, is something they call an anthology series. Mm. So each series, as you say, there have been four of them, is a different set of characters and a different story. But they all share some characteristics mm. in common. Basically, two cops exploring gruesome murders. Mm. Where they're set is really important. And then there are also supernatural elements. What's distinctive about True, um, True Detective this time, True Detective Dark Country, is for the first time it's two female cops. And um, it's set in Alaska, so it's really cold and dark. And um, basically, a group of scientists in a remote uh, scientific research centre go missing, leaving no clues apart from a severed tongue. Bear with me. And then the question is whether their disappearance is linked mm -hmm. to the brutal murder several years before in the same place of an indigenous woman who had her tongue removed. Have we got a clip to we do. have a we look? We do. Let's yeah. have a look. The night country, it takes us one by one. This isn't going to be good. I'm thinking stuff. Bad stuff. I know. I feel it too. I guess you're thinking the worst part is done. It's not. I mean, Jodie Foster being part of this is reassuring me because I can't think of many things that she's been in that, that I haven't enjoyed. However, after the first series of True yeah. Detective, which was which was just wonderful television, Matthew McConaughey and and, and Woody Harrelson, yep. of course. Second series was okay. The third was Bobbins. Yep. Um, what about the fourth? I think this is a return to good. form. Good. Oh, good. Um, I mean, I think it's a slow burn if if that's possible in such a cold setting. Yep. Um, and obviously, I've only seen the first episode, but mm. I mean, Jodie Foster is fantastic yeah. in this. She she plays this kind of world-weary, bitter, kind of slightly mean cop. Did you watch um, Mayor of Easttown? Yes, I did. She's like that Kate Winslet yeah. character, yeah. but uh, turbocharged. Mm -hmm. um, she's terrific. <laughs> the couple of things I wasn't so sure about, so the two cops at the moment don't get on. They really hate each other. Mm -hmm. That felt a little bit manufactured to me, but it may be we understand that more as we see more episodes. Yeah, and, uh, and, it, and, it, and of course, and it, and it throws back to the first series where there was a, something of a fractious relationship between those two. Exactly. Those two as well. But look, wh whilst we've got you, Rebecca, mm. a couple of other things that, that have been cropping around. I mean, I think there'll be plenty of people who are very, very pleased to hear the news that Holly Willoughby is making her return to telly and, you know, and not before time. Yes, she returned to telly on Sunday, uh, the return of Dancing on Ice, which I couldn't quite believe it's 
16th series. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, I can. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's been a turbulent time for her, hasn't it? She, you'll remember, stepped back from this morning three months or so ago after an alleged kidnap plot. But before that, it had, it had been difficult as well because... Of course, the fact she did relationship with Philip Schofield and all the revelations about his conduct. Exactly, uh, after he stepped down uh, in, uh, uh, in the summer last year. So um, a lot of people were thinking, well, you know, would she address anything that had happened? But as it was, she came on, she looked amazing, she carried on as normal. And actually, her because she used to present Dancing on Ice with Philip of course, Schofield, of um, her new uh, partner in crime, so to speak, is uh, Stephen Mulhern. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, I thought the vibe between them was great. Yeah. She seemed really relaxed with him. I think they used to present kids' TV they together did. 20 many, many years, years ago. ago yeah. And you could see that they had a rapport. Um, and um, no, I mean, it, it, she, she was cracking. The, the show itself... <laughs> <laughs> we'll reserve judgment exactly. on that, but it's nice to see her back. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. We cannot have you on, Rebecca, without without just touching on, on the BAFTA nominations which have been out this week. Yeah. I am assuming it's, you know, Barbie and Oppenheimer everywhere again, isn't it? Well, it's certainly Oppenheimer. That's got the most nominations, 13 nominations. Wow. I've still not seen it. I've still not seen it. You've not no, seen no, it? No, I know, I know, I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's got to be a film, I think, that you see in the cinema, yeah. though. That would be my advice. Uh, I mean, terrific. I saw that one day and then Bobby the following day, which I think was the order to do it in, actually. It was like the main course followed by the pudding. Um, but uh, terrific and uh, nominated for Best Film, uh, three-hour epic, of course, and its um, star, Killian Murphy, I think will probably win Best Actor. Barbie, uh, taken more at the box office than um, uh, Oppenheimer, of course, only got five nominations. Not Best Film, not Best Director for Greta Gerwig, which I was a little disappointed about, but Margot Robbie did get a Best Actress nod and, and Ryan Gosling there. <laughs> I'm just looking at him, it's making me laugh. Uh, he got a Best Supporting Actor nod as well. And poor things. I ought to bring us right back to the beginning. Of course. 11 nominations, including Best Film and Emma Stone for Best Actress. Got to say, poor things has gone straight to the top of my list, closely followed by, by True Detective. Rebecca? Yeah. Yeah. been an absolute pleasure having you in the studio. Thank you so much for your recommendations. Have a lovely weekend when I've it comes. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks, Neil. Uh, time for us to see what's happening in the world of sport. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Two thousand and twenty-four will mark the return of the Olympic Games to Europe for the first time since London 2012. Team GB sprinters have an enviable strength in depth, but only three male and three female sprinters can compete in the individual events. Eugene Amodadzi is one of a number of British sub-10 second 100 metre male sprinters. He's a little bit different though. Yeah, a late starter, very late in fact. He began just five years ago, narrowly missing out on the World Championship 100 metre final last summer at the age of 31. He's getting faster though and that's all the more incredible as before he began sprinting he'd forged himself a career. Meet the world's fastest accountant. Right now I, I still don't refer to myself as a sprinter. I'm just a chartered accountant. World's well, fastest accountant, that's why I like to call myself. <laughs> Hey, every penny, every little helps, right? That's what that's what people think accountants are. I'm unbelievably proud of my accountant qualification. You know, my parents pushed me to, you know, go to school, do well, get good grades, um, and qualify, you know, as something. Being from a West African household, it was called like doctor, lawyer, engineer, um, accountant. So I guess I went down that route. So I'm incredibly proud of it, um, and you know, I've had those aspirations of climbing the corporate ladder. Ooh. How, do you, how, how far do you reckon it is from here to there? About 100 metres? <laughs> I always used to sort of test myself little trivial things like, I've got two minutes to make the train, I reckon I can make it if I just go for it. And I'm like, surely I'm the only person who could actually do this. So you've always been competitive? I'll, yeah, I'll take like to anything. I just want to win. But my best friend's name is Ben. So. <laughs> and so emerged somewhat later than is normal, Eugene is 31, after school, university, qualifications galore, and an established corporate career. So I'm trying to decompress my ankle. An athlete, a sprinter, a sub 10 second flyer. Right, you're around sort of 26-ish, I think. When, when I started. You, no, not when you started. 
Yeah, you did athletics before that, but when you made the decision... I didn't, I didn't do athletics before that. Huh? I didn't do it before 26. You did? No, I didn't. You told me the other day. You were, yeah, I could do this, I could do that. What, as in, like, I did it at school? That's what I mean! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. David, thanks very much indeed. Uh, time for us to take a very short break. Coming up after it, uh, not quite the warm weather winter break, a team of professional footballers from Denmark were expected as they ended up deep in the Scottish Highlands on the coldest day of the year. Why? Find out next. We all live in an uncertain world. From global conflict and crises to moments full of hope and unity. We'll take you to the heart of the story and help you understand the world around us. Join me, Yalda Hakim, on my new show, The World, on Sky News. I'm Katie Spencer and I'm Sky News' arts and entertainment correspondent. As a team, we've interviewed some of the biggest stars in the world, the likes of Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, Sir Elton John. We try to give you an honest sense of how these people really are. I'm David Blevins and I'm Sky's Senior Ireland Correspondent. I'm based in Belfast, a city transformed by peace but still struggling with its past. Politically, the two sides are as far apart as ever and it's over that question of who has sovereignty in Northern Ireland. The very issue that's been the source of tension here for generations. It takes 60 minutes to cross the Irish Sea. It took the British monarchy a century. I've spent 25 years reporting the journey from conflict to peace. The political parties of Northern Ireland have reached agreement. We help you understand the world with us. Today, we have reached an agreement with the Conservative Party on support for government in Parliament. We already know what the government gets out of this deal. What exactly does the DUP get out of it? Well, £1.5 billion. Pounds. Welcome to Winterfell. It's an iconic location in this globally acclaimed drama. Ophelia was the most powerful hurricane this far east in the Atlantic on record. You can't live in a place like this and not appreciate the environment.
Welcome back. Now, as you may or you may not know, this is not the only show I present. The uh, Taskmasters at Sky really do like to get their money's worth. You can also find me on the Sky News Daily podcast, where every weekday we took a look at one particularly interesting thing in the news and spend quite a bit of time trying to get an understanding of it. This week, well, there, the title is there. Does it matter how young or old our politicians are? If you were watching Breakfast yesterday, you'll have seen the former Prime Minister, now, of course, retired from frontline uh, front politics. Politics. Gordon Brown speaking to Kay Burley, saying he was too young, uh, sorry, too too old to be a British politician. Again, uh, too young to be a politician in America. And he's got a point. When you think about the fact that currently the two men most likely to be fighting out for the White House are Joe Biden, currently 81, and a Donald Trump coming in at a sprightly 77. Look across the channel to France, where you'll find uh, the French president and the French prime minister taken together, their age still less, their combined age still less than 81. So I've been speaking to Harriet Harman uh, from Labour, Amy Callaghan from the SNP, differing experiences, different ages about their experience of age in politics. But finally, from Friday night, when you hear about footballers taking a much needed winter break, you might assume they'll be lying on a beach in the Middle East and doing just a little bit of keepy uppy. The Danish side, M FC Midtjylland, apologies to our Danish viewers, uh, they were invited to the Scottish Highland estate that belongs to their wealthy owner. But if the players were expecting a whiskey and a piece of shortbread, they got what I'd like to call a wee surprise. Instead, they went on a team building exercise, hiking up a local mountain in temperatures touching minus 20 degrees. Players complained of losing the feeling in their hands and feet and certainly weren't impressed when the group got split up, uh, meaning that they had something of a long wait before a chopper arrived to take them back to base. Just, just, just for the avoidance of doubt, it is incredibly cold in Scotland at the best of times. It's even worse if you're up a mountain. And if you're up a mountain on the coldest day in the year, you better put your long johns on. Appropriately enough, let's have a look and see how the weather is looking this weekend in the Scottish Islands and everywhere else. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. As you can see, all changed this weekend as the snow and the ice are replaced by wind and rain with the arrival of Storm Isha on Sunday. At most places, though, at dry this evening, although wintry showers will continue in the far north. Meanwhile, Western Ireland turning cloudy and windy as a brand of rain approaches. That rain will spread across Ireland into Northern Ireland and Scotland overnight with an ice risk and some hill snow. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. And that is your lot for this Friday night with me, Neil Patterson. Coming up, Sky News at 10 with Gillian Joseph. We'll be seeing you next Friday night.